The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, welcome to the fifth and final day of Public Hearing 32, dealing with uh, service providers revisited. We commence uh, today, as always, with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the Jagera people and the Turbal people as the traditional custodians of Mianjin, Brisbane, the land on which we are gathered uh, for the purposes of this hearing. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge uh, First Nations people who are participating in this hearing, including those who uh, may be following the hearing either in person or via the live stream. Now, I understand that there are some further appearances uh, to be announced uh, today. Yes, if the Commission pleases, my name is Luke. I appear for Mabel. Yes, thank you very much. If the Commission pleases, my name is Whiteley. I appear for higher up. Thank you, Ms. Whiteley. And uh, no other appearances? In that case, Ms. Dowsett, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, as you've said, that. We begin this morning with a panel on digital platforms, and I understand the witnesses have all made their oath or affirmation before we came in this morning, so we're right to, to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to each member of the panel for coming this morning. I understand uh, that you may have been travelling from interstate this morning, at least some of you, so thank you. Thank you to the airlines for getting you here. <laughs> Uh, we appreciate your assistance. Uh, I shall now ask uh, Ms Dowser to ask you some questions. Thank you very much. If I could begin with you, Ms O'Reilly, you are a co-founder of Higher Up and you are a, an advisor to the board. Uh, I am a co-founder of Higher Up alongside my brother Jordan and I'm also co-CEO of the business. I've been in that position uh, since January of last year. And Jackie Armstrong, Ms Armstrong, you are a director of Higher Up. I am, yes. Right. And the final member of our panel, um, Mr Scott, you are co-director, co-founder and executive director of Mabel. That's correct. Right. Now, just to give some context to this panel, I just want to read very briefly from Higher Up's annual report 2020-2021. Higher Up says... Along with at least seven others, we are part of a seismic shift in how support work is being organised and performed. We're doing away with traditional rosters and giving more flexibility and choice, both to people with disability and to their support workers. Now, I, I see that you're nodding. You, you agree that, that that's what the digital platform is doing in this disability service sector. And Mr. Mr. Scott, do you agree from Mabel? Yes, no, I broadly agree with that. Okay. Have you been following this week's hearing? Yes. Okay, so you'll understand that we begin with some general questions about corporate structure and the, the people to whom you provide services. So if I can begin with higher up, and I'll direct my question to, to you, uh, Ms. Armstrong, but Ms. O'Reilly... If you want to add something, then please do. Sure. The, the current corporate structure is that you have seven directors. Yes. And of those, how many are people living with disability? I am the, I'm, I'm the sole director who lives with disability. I am blind and have a guide dog. My twin sister also has cerebral palsy. But there are other directors on our board with lived experience of disability. And Higher Up has... Uh, in January 2021, launched an observership program for its board of directors. How many participants have you had through that program? Uh, we've had three so far. We're about to have our fourth and fifth this year. Right. And do you know, have any of those observers gone on to board roles? I couldn't tell you if they've gone on to board roles at the moment, but we've provided a strong foundation through formal training, external training, and they're also remunerated during their time on Higher Ups Board. Thank you. Uh, turning to you, Mr Scott, for Mabel, there are eight current, current directors? Uh, seven current directors. Seven. And are any of those people with disability? The chairperson is a um, parent of a child with a disability, but no people on the board that have uh, lived experience of a disability. Uh, we have been in conversation with somebody for the past nine months around taking a board role because the board is in agreement that we 
should have at that governance level, a person with a disability, and we hope to have a, a, um, a landing on that shortly. It's just been other work commitments that have prohibited that. Um, and in the meantime, we work closely with an independent disability advisory uh, council, of which the chair of Mabel and I attend. Turning then to your service users, and I'll stay with you, Mr Scott, for the moment. Um, Mabel tell us in its response to a notice from the, the Royal Commission that in September 2022, Mabel, sorry, 9,897 support workers delivered 383,624 hours of support to, uh, to 14,899 clients. That, that's correct. I think we also uh, clarified that of those clients, about 58% were people with um, NDS funding. And so doing the maths, that's uh, slightly in excess of 8,500 NDIS participants in the month of September that's 2022. Correct. Yeah. Is that indicative of uh, Mabel's service user population generally? You have about that many NDIS participants. Uh, that's right. As of September, it would be more than that today, um, but I don't have the exact numbers, but very much um, consistent with the sorts of scale that Mabel operates at. And turning to higher up, you tell us in your response that you have 7,476 individual disability service users? Uh, so HireUp has about 26,000 um, people with disability who are, who are um, active on the, on the platform. About 11,000 of those were, were on average active in the, per month in the last year. And how many of those active participants are NDIS participants? The vast majority of, of, of HireUp's client base are NDIS participants. We uh, only provide services to, to, to people with disability in, and most of our, our participants come through the NDIS. And some of those come as individuals, some come through a support coordinator and some come to you through other providers? Correct. I want to turn now to um, ask you for a very brief overview of how your platforms operate. So I, I, I'll stick with higher up. You have clients and support workers and they have profiles. People need to build a profile. Yes, that's correct. And the profile for a participant includes details about them, their interests, their support needs, and a photograph. That's correct, yes. Right. In what circumstances can those profiles of participants be seen? So who sees those profiles and when? Mm -hmm. uh, so HireUp is a um, sort of, you can think of it as a gated community. So um, our support workers and our clients come through an extensive onboarding process to, to be able to get access to the to the HireUp um, sort of community. Um, our support workers in particular go through extensive checks before they are approved to be able to use the platform. And it is at that point that both parties, clients and support workers are approved that they're able then to look at each other's information, look at each other's profiles um, and start, you know, finding opportunities to work together. Right. And you operate on that on the higher up platform something called a job board where clients outline their requirements and support workers can look at the job board and elect to take or not take uh, the particular job. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. So there are a number of ways that HireUp facilitate. HireUp's fundamental purpose is putting people with disability in control of their support workers. Can so we I have just ask you to slow down a little? Sure. Uh, we have two key ways that we uh, connect parties. One is through search. So the ability to search for key terms, um, character traits, qualifications, etc., to, to find support workers. Um, and then as the jobs board, as you mentioned. But one important thing to point out is that HireUp is uses an online platform. It's a big part of what what we do, but we are also an NDIS registered service provider and we also offer our, our community other supported ways to connect. And so an example of that is our team builder service. Um, it's a person in our, in our team who can help our clients build their team if they're not able to use the digital platform. Is that like a support coordinator or actually a support coordinator? It's not like a support coordinator or actually a support coordinator. Uh, the team builder <laughs> function is a sort of one-off, the client will tell us what they need and our, our team will, will help to, to find the right worker. And that reflects the fact that HireUp's all about choice and control and trying to you know, support our community to access support the way that works for them. For some, the jobs board is perfect. For others, some people need a bit more help and, and, and we cater to, to, to all of those support needs. Right. And we'll 
get into training a little in a little more detail later, but just now in this setting up of the, the relationship in the platform, your support workers undergo client-specific training before they commence to deliver services to a participant. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so HireUp has... Um five mandatory trainings that we require all of our support workers to undertake before they are able to, to deliver services. Um, critical to, to this commission is, is our, um, our module on preventing abuse and neglect. We also require um, our support workers to hold a valid first aid or CPR uh, certificate, um, and all of our uh, support workers mandatorily undertake the NDIS worker orientation. We then have a, a very individualised training system after that, but those are the baseline um, mandatory trainings, and we pay our workers to undertake those trainings. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr Scott, turning to Mabel, again, you're a digital platform and people have profiles. So, we'll start with support workers. If a support worker wanted to be on the Mabel platform, they sign up and create a profile. That's correct. And then they have to go through what's called a verification process. That's correct. And you've set that out on page three of the response. But if you could just perhaps talk us through the key checks that are form part of that verification process. Yeah, so um, broadly it's about... Uh, the, the, the uh, worker screening is built on police checks and identification checks and uh, certain qualification checks depending on the services being offered. So for high-risk services like personal care, you need a Cert 3 or a Cert 4 equivalent qualification to be able to offer that service. If you want to offer nursing services, you'll need your APRA registration, which will check with the APRA database, uh, similar for, for allied health. Um, reference checks are part of that uh, screening process as well. Right. And so once a support worker has gone through the verification process, then they go through onboarding. And can you? this is where they acknowledge, so the support worker will be bound by the Mabel Code of Conduct and the NDIS Code of Conduct? That's right. And then they're prompted to undertake the NDIS Worker Orientation Module? That's right. They're, they're made away, aware of their obligation to abide by the Code of Conduct and they're prompted to undertake the training in multiple places. But it's not compulsory for them to undertake that training? It's not compulsory, but we've had a high level of take-up of uh, support providers on the platform doing that training. I think you, you tell us that 53% of support workers share their certificate completion. That's right. If they share their certificate of completion, it's, it's identified on their profile as having completed that training. And when you look at the 53% uh, in relation to the 58% of people on our platform that are, uh, have NDS funding, and also the fact that a lot of people... Um, work on Mabel, it may work for a provider or may work on other platforms. Uh, we uh, believe that many more people have completed that training than have provided their certificates. Right. So that's your support workers, independent contractors in the Mabel platform. For service users, is it similar to what we heard through Higher Up that they create a profile in which they give details of their biography, their interests, their support needs, what it is that they're looking for? They do create a profile uh, that articulates much of that, but they also can, uh, as we talked about through search and job posts, a lot of the job posts are quite detailed in terms of, you know, what they're looking for and who they are. They can be very specific in terms of uh, communicating that to prospective support workers. And when is the service user profile visible and who is it visible to? It's, it's visible to support workers that have entered into an agreement with the client. So it's not visible broadly, it's visible uh, when they enter an agreement and the person with the disability can share their profile with a prospective worker. So, so during the job search phase, you only see the, the details of the job for the service user, you don't see their broader profile? No, they're, they're able to communicate during the uh, process of meet and greets, whether it's a virtual meet and greet by the platform or a phone call or a meet and greet in a cafe. They're able to have more direct discussions around uh, who they are and their needs in both parties assessing whether this is a suitable relationship. And that's part of the process of determining is it the right support for each party. Right. Can I ask you what, the, uh, to describe the nature of the services that, that Mabel support workers provide, what, what is it that people are doing on your platform? So I think it's a variety, it's a really diverse set of services that I think respond to people's desire to live independently and be included socially and economically. And I think one of the, the things that's always stuck by me as a person with a disability saying, 
you know, the old system was about support to live, the new system's about support to live a life, a good life. And so the nature of support work is changing, that it needs to be much more diverse. So I think people can engage the, the you know, really tailor and build a team around their goals and their sort of vision of independent living and inclusion. So everything from various uh, services to support that independent living, from help around the house, help with shopping, meal preparation, through to personal care, nursing services, allied health services, but they might be finding somebody to help them uh, learn the skills of resume writing or preparing for a job, for example, or learning the skills to live independently. Are you able to tell us what proportion of the work that's done through the Mabel platform is the what might be described as intimate personal care? So looking after somebody in their home, helping them with those daily intimate personal care. I might have to take that proportion on notice to give you an answer, but I, I think it's going to be a number like 25%. Right. Um, would you, what would you say to the proposition that it, um, it may appear that the work of the nature performed on the platforms could contribute to a, a creaming off the easier work, doing the, the nicer, gentler things like community engagement, going out for coffee or engaging somebody for, for resume writing, but less of the the hard stuff. Yeah. I, I think uh, I would go back to the fact that I think um, support needs are very diverse and it's not just about personal care being hard and the rest of it being simple. I think there is a need for lots of people with various life experience to come into the sector with lots of capabilities to be able to support people to live an ordinary life. And so I think one of the things Mabel is doing is opening up the diversity of people coming to the sector to offer those uh, services. So I, I wouldn't accept that that's the right characterisation. And if I could put that same proposition to Higher Up, how would you respond to it? Mm. Higher Up has quite a different approach to, to Mabel. Um, as I mentioned, we are an NDIS registered service provider um, and we employ our support workers. And we do that because I think I, you know, I agree with your proposition that it is important, I think, for service providers to be able to provide you know, the, to go with our clients to the more complex parts of their life where they, where they need support. So in, on the HireUp platform, um, we um, again, we can clarify the exact number, but it's probably closer to 75% of the supports delivered through through uh, HireUp are at the more complex end. Um, that's We are registered um, for to be able to deliver services under a number of complex um, uh, ca categories in the, in, the, uh, in the registration process. So an example um, of, of one of the supports that we provide is behaviour support. Um, we have uh, a large complex support team in Higher Up who provide additional services to our clients over and above the platform, um, up to and including behaviour coordinators who, for example, help with the process of training support workers in the client's behaviour support plan. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we actively um, try to provide more complex uh, supports to our clients. If I could move on to workforce... So uh, Higher Up tells us that it has, and I think you may have given the number a little while ago, uh, Ms O'Reilly, but you tell us in your response that you have 26,965 26, workers, which includes office staff and support workers, mm -hmm. and you have this concept of an approved support worker. This mm -hmm. is somebody who has passed all of the aspects of Higher Up registration, all of the checks. And in that category, you have people who are casual, part-time or full-time. Yes. And the casual is 26,550, so the vast proportion mm -hmm. is casual. Mm -hmm. uh, you tell us that you've offered eligible casuals the opportunity to transition to permanent employment, but less than 2% take that up. Mm -hmm. You've given us a monthly attrition rate for your workforce. Do you have annual attrition rate figures? Um, I don't have that to hand. We can we, we will need to provide that. Um, but the way that the the way that the higher up platform works is that support workers are really in charge of, of of what supports they want to deliver and which work they want to do. So we we look at churn monthly because we look at how many workers are active in one month compared to the prior month. Can I know can I remind you just to speak a little more slowly? Apologies. Thank you. Um, 
We know that about 40% of workers who churn in any given month resume within the next three months. So it's, and recently I saw numbers that we have um, people resume on the platform who haven't used it for many years. So it's, it's quite tricky in the, the context of being a platform to, to have those annual, uh, annual numbers. How does the, the casualised and that transient nature of the workforce that you're describing, how does that affect higher ups capacity to provide continuity of care to mm. its customers? Yeah, it's a really important um, feature of the higher-up approach that we employ our support workers. So all of our workers are employed. As you mentioned, many are, um, are casually employed, but they are still, of course, entitled to um, all of their, the entitlements under the SHADS Award, superannuation, workers' compensation, back-to-work supports, etc. So that's a really important part of what we do. In terms of, um, of the casual... In terms of the, uh, the casual... Uh, workers on, on the platform, what we see is that the higher up model offers an interesting combination of both flexibility and control. Um, often when we talk about casualisation being a challenge in the sector, it's because employees don't have much control roster to roster of how they're going to be working. On higher up, what we see is our workers are totally in control of how much work they'll take on um, when they want to work. So I think the higher up value proposition is an interesting combination of, of, of that flexibility um, and also control. Um, and for that reason, we see many people seek to join the, the higher up platform. And as you mentioned, although we offer casual conversion and the opportunity for our workers to be um, per, uh, permanently employed, when we first sent out 2,000 invitations to eligible workers offering that, them that opportunity, only 50 responded and wanted to take it up. So we see that, um, yeah, that, that there's, it's an attractive proposition, I think, to many workers. And do you tell us that 55% of the active support workers use higher up as a secondary source of income? That's correct, yes. Right. Uh, turning to you, Mr Scott, and to, to Mabel, so your workforce is comprised of contractors, individual contractors. Yeah, people that are choosing to be self-employed. Right. And you also have a, a number of organisations who have um, joined the platform and you've provided us some information about that in the response to the notice, but I've received information you'd like to make a correction to that. So would you like to explain how organisations yeah. fit into the Mabel model? Yeah, so I think, you know, and, and keeping in mind, I guess, one of the differences between what Mabel's doing versus higher up is, you know, we operate more at that self-directed end of the disability uh, support marketplace. So people using Mabel are um, self-managing and plan managing. We're not um, having people that are agency managing with more complex needs coming to the platform. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the vision of Mabel, it's really about, you know, connecting people with people. That's the vision. How do we connect people that need support with people that can offer their support within their community? Um, whether the people are self-employed workers or potential employees of an organisation, you know, our long-term vision is we're agnostic around that and what we really want to do is offer the opportunity for organisations to be on the platform, for their employees to be on the platform so people can build a team of support around choosing the right people and uh, less about, you know, how people choose to uh, engage in employment in the sector. Okay. Do you wanted to correct something? Oh, sorry. Um, just, yeah, so the correction try, was... We're trying to work out what it is you're correcting. <laughs> oh, so what, what I am correcting, sorry, got lost in that answer. But um, yes, what we were correcting is that we we have a pilot underway. Uh, I'd had originally um, submitted that there were six organisations. It's actually five organisations, uh, three of which are onboarded and two of which are in the process of onboarding. Right. Um, Chair, for your information, that's on page three of the Thank label you. response. So the, these are five businesses who have registered their, their organisation on the platform. So then that organisation and all of its employees are coming through the platform able to be searched by people seeking services. So at the moment it's a pilot, so it's a bit of a hybrid where the organisation is, is visible via the platform and, and its employees are visible via that organisational login. But the long-term goal is to create visibility over people that are employed in the sector by organisations and you'll be able to search for people based on your criteria and look across who's available, including people that are self-employed or employed by providers. Can I understand something a little more about the verification process, <coughs> pardon me, that you describe on page three of your response? Does uh, Mabel actually meet in person? 
anybody who wishes to become a service provider through uh, your portal, as it were? No, we don't. There are then people who will be able to perform services for NDIS participants whom you haven't met and who have no formal qualifications. So uh, if they're providing high-risk services like personal care, they have to have a Cert 3 or a Cert 4? I understand that, but there are some who will be available for services that do not require any qualifications. That's correct, in the sense that for lower-risk services, that is the case, and then people with a disability are able to assess whether they're the right people for them. So there's a lot of transparency around the qualifications of the individuals that are offering services in their local area. And the person's able to judge is a qualification important for this particular service or are other qualities more important for this particular service subject you know, to... Right. <coughs> You've included as a dot point reference checks. What, what does that involve for somebody who wishes in effect to become uh, a uh, participant in your structure? Yes, yeah, so it, it depends uh, on the services they're offering but if it was high risk service it would be a professional reference check that we would be doing as part of that process and if it was... Um, People new to the sector offering lower risk services, we'd be looking at both personal and professional references. Like what? So, for example, um, uh, one of the people that I've spoken to that became a support worker was somebody who'd been working at uh, a major, um, you know, Woolworths for a long part of their career and was changing careers. And that person was uh, looking to enter this sector, offering social support and domestic assistance. We would look at reference checks that may be relevant to somebody that she's worked with at Woolworths, for example. I notice uh, that uh, you provide for, we've got insurance coverage. You say on page, uh, I think it's eight, all services logged on the platform are covered by a suite of insurances, public liability, professional indemnity and personal accident cover. Um, how is that intended to work? Yeah, so uh, one of the um, features of Mabel is providing safeguards to all parties that engage, and insurance has been part of that safeguard since the beginning in 2014. Uh, so we have a suite of insurances through Berkshire Hathaway Specialty Insurances today across public liability, professional indemnity and personal accident cover. So for services that are delivered that are delivered via the platform and logged via the platform, then there's automatic coverage for the workers providing those services on the platform that also can be accessed by clients. What about coverage for the clients if uh, the people you provide don't do what they're meant to do yeah. or engage in the worst case in yes. some form of abuse? Yeah, so the, the clients would uh, be able to uh, take action against the insurances that cover the service providers on the platform. The client would take action on that hypothesis against the actual service provider. That's right. Not I think, against your organisation. Well, I, th I think it depends on if our organisation, I think, is at fault around the things that we do. I think it's important to understand the respective roles that we are a facilitator of connections and the safeguards around that connection we take very seriously and we talk a lot about the multi-layered safeguards. I think if we're failing to do what we say we do around the safeguards or we're aware yes, I, of risk. I, I understand that, but I'm just trying to understand what safeguards there are for the clients in the event of something going wrong. So do the insurance policies name, uh, either by name or in some other way, the actual service provider as a beneficiary of the policy, the indemnity policy? I, I might have to take that very specific it's question on notice and I'm happy question. to come back to you with the real clarity on that. That's a rather important yeah, question. Yes, understood. Thank you. thank you, Chair. Just picking up on that question of safeguards, and you said that you, you take that issue very seriously, once the person is through the verification process, there's no ongoing quality assurance by Mabel, is there? there? There's no supervision? Well, I, I think there's, you know, I would say a multi-layered approach to that quality assurance. I think supervision is a challenge for providers in the sector because the services are delivered inside homes and inside communities, and so there's not a, a person that has a direct line of sight in a supervisory role generally. One of the things we think about is that the best person to actually understand the experience is the person receiving that experience and, and for people via Mabel. Can I just pause you there? So you put the onus on the service recipient to be doing all of the supervision and quality no, I, assurance. I think 
uh, service recipients using Mabel want to have that direct relationship with the service providers. They want the service providers to be accountable to them and express what's important to them. And they're able to judge whether that's a suitable service in a relationship and empowered to discontinue that relationship if it's not working. But then we have a whole uh, a process of collecting non-invasive, continuous feedback on that quality experience. So whether it's ratings and reviews that people can provide around the experience with specific workers or post-engagement surveys or MPS surveys, but also um, <coughs> you know, part of the whole co-design process of Mabel is we are constantly listening and talking to our community. We have small batch research happening all the time. So one of the things about Mabel is it's set up to be a human-centered design solution and a co-design solution. So our feedback is loops are, are pretty consistent, uh, constant including incidents complaints frameworks as well and, and making it easy for people to uh, lodge complaints and incidents. So if a, a service user lodges a complaint with Mabel, the, you have, you've said you, ha you have this complaints framework, what's the, what's the outcome that can occur other than the person leaves a bad review or is um, removed from the platform? What else do you yeah. do? And, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, also as part of that process, the person with the disability is empowered to make a decision whether they want to continue in that relationship. But where they're providing feedback around a complaint, it could be around the operations of the Mabel platform, it could be around the engagement with our uh, team, but it could be in relation to the behaviour of another party. And, you know, what we will do is seek to understand the nature of that complaint uh, by speaking to both parties and look at ways where we can help them resolve it. And that may be doing things like pointing them to training on the Mabel Learning Hub. We have a Mabel Learning Hub with 170 courses from subject matter experts. It's not Mabel training, but it's, it's expert training from the Council of Intellectual Disabilities through to Cerebral Palsy Alliance, NDS, um, enable a gamified training. There's a large library there of courses that uh, the person could be pointed to to actually understand more the expectation of their client. Is it fair to say that the Mabel business model relies upon other providers having trained a worker to reach a sufficient level of competence to begin providing services? You, you, you need people to come in with a base level of skill. No, I, I don't think that's the case. I think if they're providing high-risk services, they need to evidence their qualifications. Uh, I think when it comes to people that work in the sector historically that are working on Mabel, I think in many respects I see that as a part of a career path that it's important in the sector, that in this sector people working in it can have the career path of starting their own small business. We've had people become sole traders that have gone on to incorporate and start to employ others and that's a career path that's available in most sectors of the Australian economy. But we're also bringing in a large number of people new to sector and they might be coming in to, to do uh, important work supporting people in their community, a regional community, a cultural community. They're offering low risk services initially. They're engaging directly with their clients. And in that case, there's pathways to upskilling. And one of the things that we're conscious of is that Cert 3 is about 35% of them are completed and the rest are abandoned. And one of the things we think about is, is people coming into the sector, um, being able to access that training and invest in themselves is important. Under the, you've told us in your response that Mabel has a minimum contractual hourly rate of $32 an hour. Is that for all categories of work? It's, it's essentially um, a, a level of protection that exists on the platform. You can't contract below that rate, but people contract directly and agree the rates with their clients. So the average rates for personal... No, I'm sorry, you, you're not answering the question. Does the minimum contractual rate, $32 an hour, apply to... Any category of work done through the any platform? Any work done through the platform. And you've told us that there are platform fees or that, that independent contractors pay. And so once that platform fee is removed, that, that minimum contractual rate becomes $28.80 an hour. That's correct. How was that rate determined? It's, it's determined to approximate the minimum wage allowing for superannuation and platform fees. The, the minimum base rate? Or the minimum casual, casual, casual rate. rate. And how often is it reviewed and updated? So we, we tend to look at it annually or if new information comes uh, becomes available. It's, it's something we'll remu review around the middle of this year. Right. Um, if I can turn back to higher up, I'm, I'm sorry, I've left you sitting there for a while. You tell us that your workers are paid under the SHADS Award, the Social Community Housing Care and Disability Services Industry Award. And 
On page 16 of the response, you say that the base level for shifts over two hours is above SHAD's level 3.2. Correct. Given that phrasing, that the base level for shifts over two hours, is it the case that higher up have shifts under two hours? Yes, so this was an interesting challenge for us with changes to the SHADS Award uh, last year where there were um, the introduction of, of, um, of minimums. We pay our workers um, for two hours, but we do allow our clients to book for one hour. And that is our attempt to balance the entitlements and the rights of our workforce, but also the, the need in, uh, amongst many people with disability to just access an hour of support perhaps for, you know, for a shower or for, for personal care. Um, so on those shifts, HireUp makes a loss. We, we carry the cost of that. But that is a very important part of our of our approach to um, enabling um, our, our workers to to, to um, achieve their their entitlements under the under the award, but also meet the needs of our clients. And you reference that the the minimum rate of a SHADS level three point two, but do you mean Schedule B, which is the Social and Community Services employees schedule, or Schedule E, the home care employees? Schedule? Home care. I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm trying to, to keep this on. Um, in its response, Higher Up have told us that it sees that there are some positives to the, the worker screening approach, but there are also some challenges, and you reference the delays, the turnaround times, and inconsistency between various jurisdictions. You've said that you would that may sorry higher up supports a national worker screening process. Would you like to explain why you would support that and what you would like that to look like? Mm, absolutely. So higher up um, very much supports that the, the this the. Uh, move to a situation where all workers who are working in the NDIS, um, who are providing direct supports, personal care supports in particular, but direct supports to people with disability, should have to undergo minimum checks um, and to, to, to check that, that people are fit and proper. Um, as we heard Laurie Lee say um, in this place on, on remember, Wednesday. Remember, remember. Nice and slow. I apologise. <laughs> slow, is, slow is not my strength. I apologise. Um, as we heard Laurie Lee uh, say on Wednesday, it is currently the, the case that it is possible for someone with a conviction for murder to, to get an ABN and to be able to, to work in the NDIS. And we think that that is an unacceptable situation and that all workers should have to undertake uh, worker screening. And certainly we, we ensure that all of our workers are, are thus screened. Uh, and back to you, Mr Scott. Now, I acknowledge that these are independent contractors. They're not um, higher-up employees, but you've said in your response that higher-up would like to... Sorry, Mabel, I apologise. Mabel would like to have more of... Uh, more registered NDIS providers on its platform. Why would you like that, and what are you doing to achieve that? Yeah, so I think it's more a, a broad point that people uh, that are self-managing and plan managing have a choice about who they engage, could be registered or unregistered. Predominantly, we've had unregistered providers on the platform historically, but you know we would like to be uh, a, a market facilitator that gives them access to registered providers, whether they're sole traders or employees of registered providers. You know, It's not because we're attempting to broaden the demand side of the platform to agency-managed clients, but we just want to expand the, the level of choice and control that people have in terms of determining the right support for them. So having registered providers on a platform increases the level of choice and control they have. What so, information does the client or potential client get about the appropriate rate that should be paid for the particular services being offered? So I think one of the things I think Mabel does is, is support... Um, uh, is um, What's the right word? Uh, support people in making informed decisions by being able to search locally for the services that are available, who's providing them, what their qualifications are, other characteristics, and including indicative rates. So they're able to very transparently... Sorry, does, does Mabel itself provide information to the potential client as to, for example, the average rates uh, that are set out uh, on page uh, seven of uh, your document, or, or is this left to the client to work out 
uh, on a individual contracting basis with whatever information the client is able to glean. Yeah, I, d I, d I think the clients using Mabel want that level of self-direction and control to be able to agree the rates with the people they're engaging, and, and that is one of the hallmarks of Mabel, that parties agree directly on those rates. And the rates, you know, on average are, are above award and have been increasing over time, and you, you find different approaches to that. Some people with a disability... Yeah. W really value, obviously, their support and they're wanting to pay them very well. The assumption is that every client is able to negotiate freely and with all necessary information. Well, I think part of our sorry, job... Sorry, could you direct your attention to the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, th that's right. So I think that with either uh, having the capacity themselves or with a supported decision maker, or there's certainly capacity building information around what to think about when engaging supports, but they're empowered to be able to make those decisions via Mabel. And of course, if they don't feel comfortable with that, then there are many other alternative ways to engage support. Thank you. I want to move now to the topic of supervision. And so this is really um, directed towards higher up. Uh, you give us some information on pages 26 and 27 of your response about how how the supervision works, and you you say in that response, <coughs> much like Mr. Scudder's been saying, that the the best person to know what they need out of their support. I'm paraphrasing, not quoting, but empowering the person with disability to exercise choice and control to be that frontline supervisor of the work that's done for them. But in addition to that, higher up has a, a supervision structure that, that sits behind that, somebody who's supporting the support worker to know what's required of them and keeping a check-in on how things are going. And one of the things you say is that the, the higher up support is there if it's needed or if things become more complex and that, quote, more active, close quote, supervision approaches are available for clients and or support workers who need it. The question is, who decides who needs more active supervision? Mm. Uh, there is a partnership approach we, we take with our clients and our support workers to, to answering that question, and there's a different answer in each case. Um, but certainly um, there are, there are uh, times when our clients will reach out to us and say, I need more support. I'd like to um, engage, for example, a higher-up relationship manager who is a person that walks with the client on their journey and supports them with that. Um, there are other times that uh, the client will, will, that an incident will happen. For example, um, after every shift, we ask our support workers, did an incident happen on this shift? And if a support worker tells us that something's happened, that's a trigger for us to intervene. Uh, we also use significant proactive detection um, what, in our platform to be scanning constantly for signs, uh, signs that things might be going wrong. Um, and so it's a combination of the clients able to ask for that support from us. We, we advertise and publicise that it's available. But we also, um, as a registered provider, we consider it our responsibility to make sure that uh, the ecosystem is safe. And so we will always um, step in if the support worker lets us know, if the client lets us know, or if our systems let us know that something is going wrong. Is there a base level of check-in? So some of these services, perhaps many of these services, are provided in the home, perhaps by one, one support worker. Is there a, a, a standard level where somebody from the supervision structure will check in with the person receiving the support? How things are going? Is everything okay? Yes. Um, so there's a combination of human involvement in that process and technology involvement in that process. So as an example, after every shift, every new shift, every new connection between a client and a support worker, we'll ask the client digitally, how did it go? Did anything happen? Um, and we direct the client to our community support team, to our incident uh, management process, um, if they need to raise something with us. Um, for clients with more complex support needs, so as an example, clients with behaviour support needs, um, we proactively allocate a, a behaviour 
support coordinator to every client who will then proactively reach out, check in, see how things are going. Uh, so it's a, it's a really a combination approach. But I think you know the the magic I think of higher up being combining the technology and the uh, you know all all responsibility approach that we take um, is that we are able to really flex and shift the response of the of the uh, the ecosystem based on the client, their profile, their needs. And is that check-in that you were describing, so for example, the behaviour support, is that in person or is that also digital? Somebody sends you an email, sends you a message through the app? Oh, it's absolutely in person. Uh, that can be over the phone, um, but that is also, there are also many cases where that is physically in person. A behaviour support coordinator will go out and, for example, undertake training with a group of workers face-to-face. -face. Um, so it, it sort of depends where the the client is, of course, um, but it is, it's not digital, it's not an email, it's a person on the phone or, or reaching out in per, in, physically in person. And um, just to provide you the opportunity to, to answer the question to Mr Scott, that because of the nature of Mabel's platform and you're, you're a very different entity to hire up, you don't have any of that one-on-one -on -one check in with your service users, is that correct? So th that's right, we operate more at that self-directed end, although those service users would have support coordinators that they'd be working with that might be checking in uh, separately. But what we want to do is make it very easy uh, through a channel of choice to provide that feedback and we proactively seek it, as, as I said, through um, you know, post-engagement surveys, ratings and reviews, uh, net promoter score surveys, et cetera. We're constantly collecting uh, feedback about the quality of the experience. This Royal Commission's heard in a number of hearings that there isn't, that support coordination isn't something that everyone has in their plan, and even if they have it in their plan, they might not have a lot of funding for it. So if you've got one of those people who doesn't have a support coordinator, is there anyone in the model checking in on the person individually? Uh, not separate to the feedback, constant feedback loops we have, and I think that reflects the fact that People with a disability are diverse and choose what's the right model for them and the people coming to Mabel are those that are much more wanting to be self-directed, either having the capacity themselves or with the support of decision makers. Thank you all very much for, for coming along today and for sharing your evidence with you. Those are my with me, sorry, those are my questions. I'll now hand you to the chair. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Bennett first. Um, just very quickly, understanding the difference, quite different models the two of you have and uh, Higher Up is an NDIS provider, registered provider, and you're not. Um, Mr Scott, is it more, are you more like an air tasker than I, I, a disability <coughs> service provider? So, so that's right, we're not, we're not the provider of disability support, we're the conduit or the, the um, market facilitator of those connections. Air tasker is somewhat analogous in the sense that the parties engage directly. I think what's quite different about uh, Mabel as a solution is there are ongoing needs, not one-off tasks, and the relationship that forms between people around all the needs and preferences of both parties becomes critical. So it's like a dating and site. It has element. I wouldn't say it's like a dating site either, but it has advanced matching capability where you can actually reconcile the diverse needs and preferences and locations of people that need support versus people that are offering support, and it's actually helping them form relationships of choice that are really important to outcomes for both uh, parties. And... I think the other important difference is that we've heard a lot of, uh, about the need to raise the capacity of the workforce in this sector and the important work they do. And I think one of the pathways of, of bringing into this sector people that aspire to be self-employed and are willing to take on that level of responsibility is actually, I think we're raising the quality of people entering the sector through also having a pathway to self-employment. And I think we should celebrate the fact that there's diverse models. I think that's exactly what people with a disability need and people who want to work in the sector need is diverse ways of getting support and offering support. Thank you. Commissioner oh, Thank you. I thank you, all of you. Uh, it's just my one issue is we've heard this week, and I'm sure you've been watching some of the hearing, is suggestions about a national registration scheme for registering disability support workers. Briefly, could you tell me if either of you have a view on that, and if so, what that view is? Um, so I, th I think a lot of our view is informed by our community and the people we're talking to. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of it's informed by our community, the, the Disability Advisory Council in the community, and I know when the Victorian government introduced that scheme and we've actually supported awareness of it. It was actually a Mabel worker that... Can I that, suggest you 
direct attention to Commissioner McCoon's question and answer the yes. question. I think he asked you whether you're in favour of a national registration scheme. So let's find that out, out first, and then you can give briefly your reasons for whatever view you have. So, so I think what we hear from people with a disability is they'd like the scheme to be voluntary rather than mandatory. Uh, I think is what was the feedback to the Victorian government is that mandatory registration may reduce choice control and may reduce access to workforce and may not be what all people with a disability value in terms of who they engage. And so the strong message to the Victorian government was we support the scheme, but let's make it voluntary. Workers can decide to be engaged. Consumers can decide whether that's an important safeguard for them. Thank you. I'm sorry. HIREP's view is, um, is very much in favour of the, the notion of, of a national registration uh, for workers. Um, we'd like to, of course, see the you know, detail of, of any proposals, um, but it, I think it's important to point out that there is already a form of, of, um, of mandatory registration that registered providers are subject to. The employees of registered providers are required to be screened, are required to do the orientation. Um, and so I think the issue is, is, is more about making sure that everybody is is asked to comply to the same standards and closing down the very significant loopholes that exist now that um, that workers who are essentially a support worker but are doing so as an ABN contractor are not um, obliged to require to to um, adhere to the same standards and I think that is actually the the, the flaw in the system that we should uh, we should seek to, to close down. Um, thank you and thank you again for your contribution. I'm not entirely clear how your employees get paid. How do they, what, what do they get paid for? Is it based on some hours worked and how is that determined? Yes, absolutely. So our um, our employees are paid per the hour that they work. It is determined uh, in alignment with the SHADS award. So depending on the hour of the day, the time of the day. Um, the, the starting point is they have to be selected by a client to, uh, yes, to work. Yes, Correct. The, the relationship is formed between the client and the support worker. Uh, both parties agree to work to, with each other. And they invoice you and then you send them money? No, there's no invoicing. It's all through the system. So when the booking is created, let's, you know, I'd like you to come for two hours on a Saturday. That tells the worker you get two hours at the Saturday rate, depending on the time of day. Once the client says, yep, that shift happened and approves it, and the worker approves that the, the shift happened, the, the, the worker is then automatically paid. By um, who? By higher up, and um, and important importantly, we offer a surety of pay. So we pay our workers every fortnight um, for the shifts that they have, have performed, irrespective of whether we've been paid by the client. Um, and then you claim that from the NDI, correct? correct from the NDI for that uh, client the, number. Yes. So if, if the client is um, NDIA managed, we directly invoice the NDIA for those hours. If the client is plan managed, we send the invoice to the plan manager. If the client is self managed, we send the invoice to the client themselves. Thank you. That clarifies it. Thank you very much to each of you for uh, joining the panel today and for giving us the benefit of your uh, uh, experiences and the way in which your respective uh, enterprises work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we take a break or do we proceed directly to the next panel? Uh, just a very brief, maybe two minute adjournment so we can do our reconstituting. Yes, we'll take a very brief. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Dousset, Commission. Now, I understand we've been having certain technical difficulties. What is the current position? They've all been overcome, Chair. The, the panel is ready to begin. We're ready to go. We have... Uh, very good. In that case, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to the Royal Commission, uh, for those of you who have come to the Royal Commission, and uh, for doc uh, uh, is it Dr Winkler? Ms Winkler. Yes. Dr Winkler. Yes, well, thank you too for joining us remotely, and I'm pleased to say that we can see you very clearly, so that demonstrates that the technical issues have been resolved. Uh, thank you for your contributions to the Commission, and I'll now ask uh, Ms Dowser to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. I'll just begin with some brief introductions and then move on to my questions. So, uh, 
Adam Schickling, you are the National Director, Strategy and Engagement for Synapse. That's correct. And Synapse was introduced by Ms Eastman on Monday. It's part of the Human Rights Panel, so I, I won't go over what she said, but just to confirm that Synapse supports and advocates for people with brain injury and its areas of practice include the provision of supports and services to NDIS participants. Correct. How... How many members of the board, sorry, uh, excuse me, could you tell us the composition of Synapse's board by reference to how many members are people with disability? Uh, so the Synapse board currently consists of one person um, with a disability, um, a number of others that have connection to people with disability. Uh, one out of how many, may I ask? Uh, out of six. And how many NDIS participants does Synapse support? Uh, so that varies a little because of the nature of the work that we do. So we do a large amount of information and referral type services across the country where people don't necessarily um, identify individually. Um, so I, I think our engagement numbers are around uh, 120,000 a year. Um, but of those... Uh, particularly individuals that are funded through NDIS supports, probably about 600, um, and around about 1,000 or so people um, that have other funded supports that are not NDIS. And the range of services provided by Synapse include housing, direct support, personal support, and support coordination. Yes, that's correct, in an NDIS context, yes. So for today's panel, I'd like you to focus on specifically on Synapse's Cairns Community Living Initiative, or CLI. And uh, just briefly, CLI is four duplexes, so eight homes. And That's are correct. they fully occupied at the moment? They are, yes. And are they um, sole occupancy or shared occupancy? Sole. And Synapse has provided a response to this Royal Commission. Commissioners, you have that in Bundle K at Tab 1. If I could turn to you, Dr Winkler, you are the Chief Executive Officer, Founder and Executive Director of Summer Foundation. Yes. And you are also a Director of Summer Housing. That's right. Summer Foundation is a not-for-profit research and advocacy organisation focusing on resolving issue, the issue of young people living in disability people with disability living in aged care. That's right. right. And can you tell us the, the size of um, Summer Foundation's board and how many of those are people with disability? Yeah, good question. So 50% of uh, the Summer Foundation board are, are people with disability. Um, so uh, I think there are eight board members, but I, yeah. And Summer Foundation wants to see a wider range of housing types within specialist disability accommodation, SDA, and non-SDA markets. And you've pioneered what we'll refer to today as the 10 plus 1 model. Yes. And just to be clear, the Summer Foundation works with SDA providers but is not an SDA provider itself. No. Right. And Summer Foundation has provided a, state, a response to the Royal Commission, which you have at Bundle K, Tab 3, on the 24th of November, 2022. And we also have Summer Foundation's February 2023 report, Reimagining Shared Housing and Living, which is at Tab 4. Finally, Ms Brooks, you are a board member of Summer Housing. And it was established in 2017 to replicate and scale up the 10 plus 1 model. And although there is a crossover of two directors with the Summer Foundation, Summer Housing is a separate entity. That's correct. And can you tell us the, the number of people on the board and how many of those are people with disability? Yes, yeah, there are seven board directors. Um, I'm a founding board director. Um, when I was appointed as a board director for Summer Housing, I had already had 17 years um, of lived experience with disability, having used a wheelchair for most of that time, and then mobility aids. And um, I still live with a disability. I have peripheral vision loss, um, 
but my mobility is much better now. Um, but I definitely have a lived experience and understanding of the incredible barriers to people living with disability. And there is another board director as well um, who uses a wheelchair and has a similar condition to me and um, has MS. And Summer Foundation told us in its response that in a 12-month period ending November 2022, it supported 172 people with disability. That's Summer Housing. Summer Housing, yes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I want to now ask you, I'll, I'll begin with you, Mr Schickling. I want to ask you about your model, so that the CLI for you, and I'd like you to tell us briefly, if you can, what's different about your offering? Why is it innovative? Were you seeking to fill a gap or do something better? And can you also speak to how much co-design with people with disability was involved? I know it's a big question, but just a brief overview. I'm not so good at brief. Um, as, before I start, first, can I please um, pass on acknowledgement to the traditional owners of, of the country that we're on today, as well as um, the country um, upon which the activities we're talking about relate. Um, that's a really, obviously, important part um, of the work that we've done. Um, and I also need to take the opportunity to say that the, the information and the um, the discussion we have today is done with the consent of, of elders involved in the work that we're doing. Um, so with that said, starting with with the idea of, of need um, and probably the start of co-design, the initial work that we started doing with the community living initiative was really based off work we'd done many years ago around the um, issue of young people in residential aged care. Um, and uncovering, unsurprisingly, the ridiculous amount of people that were living in inappropriate settings, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, in that case, for example, there was a number of people that had literally been living um, in the Cairns Base Hospital for a number of years um, due to not being able to go back home to their communities, due to lack of services, lack of housing in Cairns, lack of service providers, all those sorts of things. So that's really where the discussion around this emerged from um, and starting to understand what those barriers were for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, it's at that point, 10 years prior to its commencement, uh, that conversations started with community and with traditional owners about what would that look like if it was different? Um, why is that happening? What are the challenges? Um, and the initial work started started at that point. So that was okay. 10 years prior to starting. Uh, so I don't mean to rush you, but we don't have time to come through the 10 years of development. So I know I asked a really broad question. I'll focus it now. What's yep. different? So the difference is, um, so there's three core components to it, I guess. The first is cultural design in the built environment, um, a critical issue in terms of how the living spaces are created to be culturally safe. Um, and when I say that, which I may touch on later, I talk about cultural safety not only for people receiving services, but for the workforce that you expect to keep there. Um, so that's one critical component. Uh, the second is then the capacity to deliver culturally informed support and services, which requires the leveraging of that environment um, and different cultural knowledge and skills that the workforce brings. Um, and the third is the broader understanding of service model and where it sits um, within community, not in terms of a physical address, but the connections with community. Thank you. If I could turn to you, Dr Winkler, um, on speaking on behalf of the Summer Foundation who pioneered 10 plus 1. So the, the model is about 10 apartments being um, peppered or sprinkled through a larger residential model with an, the, the plus one, another apartment being reserved for the service provider. So can you tell us what, what was the gap that Summer Foundation was seeking to fill in pioneering this model? Sure. So my background is I'm an occupational therapist, so I worked for years with people with very severe brain injuries who um, often wanted to live um, on their own or with their partner or with their children. Um, but were unable to do so because of the level of support that they received. And so often people with really severe brain injury, the only 
model available was a predominant model, which is um, a group home, which just really doesn't take into account that you might um, have a partner or children that you want to live with um, or that you want to, you might acquire a disability and your, your goal is to get back to, to the same living situation. I want to move on now to, Thanks. oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you oh. off. We might have had a break in there. That's okay. I saw this model in Canada probably 30 years ago when Australians didn't live much in apartments and I remember looking at the model going, thinking that would be perfect for some of the people that I that I work with um, that want to live more independently. Um, and we understand from your response, Ms Brooks, that Summer Housing has delivered 300 apartments through the 10 plus 1 model. Yes, I think we're up to 444 now. Um, and there are some um, under construction. There was a gap due to COVID, but some are under construction now. And geographically, they're, they're in Victoria and New South Wales, or have you spread out beyond the No, we, we've spread out. Uh, I think the only um, state and territories that we're not in now are Tasmania and the Northern Territory, um, but every other state and territory in Australia. I want to turn now to the question of how your models fit within the funding framework and specifically the NDIA, NDIS framework. So, um, Mr Schickling, in SINAP response, you talk at paragraph 33 about seeking to engage with the NDIA about the fund funding model to be applied. Can you tell the Royal Commission why SINAPs were seeking a different funding model? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it goes back to my earlier response in recognising that there are very different skills and knowledge and environment that needs to be created to deliver um, culturally relevant support uh, and the traditional models um, and the way that they have been funded historically um, don't align with that. Uh, so we, we certainly proactively tried to engage with the agency well before transition to try and safeguard the cultural integrity of the model. Um, importantly, recognising for providers like Synapse, our obligation is to community who have been part of that design. Um, so we have an obligation to not have it compromised. Um, I would say that it doesn't particularly fit um, the way that the NDIA funds those environments. So. And you've told us in your response that Synapse was told you have to use the SEAL funding model and you go on to say the failure to allocate funds differently prevents an evaluation of the actual impact of the services delivered. How does the funding model affect evaluation of services? Um, largely, because, so there's a number of aspects to that. Primarily one of the key elements, as I said earlier, is not understanding the impact of cultural design and not understanding the impact of culturally informed support and how that's provided, who it's provided by, um, all has a, a really significant impact on the way that resources can be allocated through something like supported independent um, living. Um, and so this idea of, of a very traditional um, group-based approach um, particularly in this environment where we have eight individual dwellings, it's not a group or a shared living arrangement, um, but that funding model is being applied to it um, regardless. Thank you. Dr Winkler, in Summer Foundation's statement to the Royal Commission, you talk on page three about the SDA tenant outcomes research that's been undertaken and on page 11 you provide us with the conclusion and you say in part that the way the scheme currently funds housing support and housing support and support coordination perpetuates the traditional group home sorry perpetuates the power of traditional group home providers at the expense of NDIS participants how could the funding model be adapted or changed to address that conclusion Hmm. So I think we need new frameworks for funding support um, where people are co-located. So I guess the model was set up to maximise choice and control. And so um, there needs to be a shared support element so that there's kind of the, you get the efficiency of people being co-located. 
Um, but then we also um, want people to, to be able to kind of choose to have their um, choose their own support workers and support providers for um, one on one. Um, there is um, so it, the model's been around since 2016, and I guess only recently has the NDIA put a line item in which really um, uh, accounts for people being able to share support um, when they're co-located. But I think that's just the first step. We need a whole kind of framework so we can kind of set ex help set expectations with tenants before they move in so they can make an informed choice and understand um, what's the shared support element um, and also you know, how the one-on-one -on -one support works and what the responsibilities are of the shared support provider versus the one-on-one -on -one provider and the SDA provider. So it's a new model and I think a lot of providers um, and also some people within the agency just see it as a different version of a group home, but that, that I guess, reverts to a kind of more institutional model um, where we want, um, I guess, the whole, the point of the model was for um, the support provider to get to know each individual person and understand how they want to live and therefore when they need support. And then once they get to know everybody, um, then be able to look for efficiencies and see where there can be some um, shared support um, rather than, I guess, come in with a, a, a silk kind of um, framework and thinking around um, providing similar to a group home. So if we can just dig in a little to the, this shared support notion, this is for unplanned supports. So uh, I'll ask you first, perhaps, Ms Brooks, how does how does that work? What What is happening in the unplanned supports? Is that a question you can address? I'm not, not exactly sure what that question well, so refers to. Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? So... Uh, Dr Winkler's just been describing that there is the, the one on one support yes. that are provided in the model and yes. then there's the the plus one the unplanned or shared support yes what what what's the value in the shared support oh, what are they doing absolutely well in in our 10 plus one and 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 of course um I'll ask Di to jump in if I miss something here. Um, but um, the 10 plus one model is is a very good model when you have people living um, in individual apartments. So they're living by themselves in, part, in apartments peppered in a large apartment block. And the plus one is another apartment where we can have, uh, and we do have, 24-7 um, support, someone living there providing 24-7 support to those people living on their own so that they feel they have the comfort and um, the confidence that they can, they don't have to have their one-on-one their -on -one support worker with them, but that they're not alone, they're not isolated, that they can call on the 24-7 support worker um, in, in, that, in that situation. And that's a very important part of our model. And Dr Winkler was just describing that relatively new line item, the online shared support mm. that, that's now in the price guide. Mm. It, so residents in the 10 plus 1 model can use their NDIS funding to, to tap into that the, the plus 1 if, if they need something during the day, Absol during the 24 hours. Absolutely, at any time, at any time. That's correct. Switching tack just a little bit, there, I wanted to explore the, the tenants' rights of the people who live in these mm. new models. So I'll stick with you, Ms. Brooks. Sorry, Ms. Brooks. How do the the people who live in the ten plus one model? How what are their rights as tenants? Ah, yes, that's very important. Um, of course, the um, tenancy acts um, different in each state and territory. Um, but um, we've, been, we've had to work with um, variations in the law. We have agreements, tenancy agreements, with every one of our tenants, um, and they must be um, NDIS participants with an SDA package, approved package. Their rights are to um, work with us to modify the apartment so that it's um, customised to really maximise their ability to live independently, as independently as possible. So lowering bench tops, making sure that they can open blinds automatically, open doors automatically, that doors are not too heavy for them to open if they're using wheelchairs. All of these things are, are challenges and barriers that I've faced myself and um, I know how difficult that can be. You know, a small step getting out onto the deck 
on your apartment or the porch on your apartment can be a barrier that means you can't go out there. So, so we work with our tenants to make sure all those modifications are made and that it's really well set up and they're feeling comfortable. They have, the, they have absolutely the right to choose their own support workers and that's completely separate from us. We don't provide the support, the, the um, home care support or, or any other supports. That's for the tenant to choose. Now, we can assist the tenant in, um, in uh, identifying and finding those supports, but that's, that's all within the choice and control of the tenant. Just sticking with the residential tenancy agreement for now. Mm. So there's an individual agreement between summer housing Correct. and each of the people that you've provided Correct. an apartment. That's to. right. Which we, in, in Victoria, that, um, that tenancy agreement incorporates the SDA agreement, but in other states that hasn't been the case, so we've had to have two agreements. Right. And Mr Shigling, in the CLI model, what is the, the, the tenant right there for the people occupying those accommodations? So, so the same again. So we have uh, standard tenancy agreements that are in place. Um, tenancy and property management um, are outsourced to another provider that have that agreement direct with the individual tenants. So Synapse doesn't have the agreement with them. That's an outsourced provider. Yes, that's right. New topic, unfunded supports. So this is something that you've both raised in, in different that sorry summer housing and signups have raised in their responses. I'd like to understand if I could what the nature of those supports are. What is it that summer housing is doing that you describe as these unfunded supports? Mm. And have you um, had any conversations with the NDIA about trying to get them funded? Yes, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there are some there are some. Um, supports that we provide that um, I feel are completely um, unnecessary to um, have funded because there shouldn't be issues in the first place. For example, um, in most instance, instances when tenants um, apply for a, an SDA package and they're NDIS participants and they're applying for an SDA package, um, in the first instance, that in, in most instances, the, um, the uh, application will be denied. And then they have to go on to appeal. And this has been um, an incredibly difficult and I think cruel and unusual punishment for people living with disability to know that they then have to face possibly a 12-month appeal process. We know that if that appeal process occurs, that almost all of the appeals are settled. So, so why put that barrier there in the first place for people who are um, disadvantaged, extremely disadvantaged, who are looking to improve their lot, are looking to improve their living conditions? Why put that barrier in their way? So Summer Housing and has stepped in with the support of Summer Foundation often too to um, work with our tenants to ensure that they go through the appeal process with support and that they do get um, a settlement that's uh, agreeable and they do get a package to enable them to live independently. So, so that's the, the kind of support that you were saying you, you, you don't think should be funded because it shouldn't happen. But what about things that once the person has their SDA yeah. funding and they're in, yeah. is there anything there yes. that you're, you're providing that you think should be funded or should be done by somebody else? Yes, yeah. I, look, I think there are ways that we could collaborate much better with the NDIA and, I, you know, for example, with the 10 plus 1 model, if, if the NDIA provided a coordinator, um, one person who could work with the 10 tenants and us to ensure that they were properly placed in their apartments, that they had the modifications done that they needed, that they got the supports that they required, that, that coordination could really fast track and improve the outcomes for our tenants. We do a lot of that, um, what I would call, we're, we're like curators, we're like facilitators. And it takes a huge amount of resources and time. We could really 
um, benefit from a far more collaborative approach by the NDIA. Mr Schickling, is there anything you'd like to add on that topic of unfunded support, the work that is being done? Yeah, I, I think importantly for us in the work we do, we would refer to what we're doing around um, really about enabling community, not providing housing. Um, so they're very, very different concepts. Um, and so there potentially is is two elements to that that issue of what is unfunded support versus what is the cost of delivering something differently. Um, and, and they're not necessarily the same thing, of course. Um, we would say certainly that we have, by way of one example, uh, we have independent mentoring, uh, cultural mentoring that is part of the model. Um, the most critical part of that is that is something we provide to all people um, that are engaged or that are part of the work that we're doing, whether they're a tenant or an employee. Uh, of course, we can look at how some of those things might be funded under an NDIS uh, package, but in terms of workforce and cost of workforce, uh, that's not something that fits the current pricing. Um, there's many other things, of course, in the way that we deliver services where um, relationships and family relationships will be such that we have obligations to a whole range of different things um, for families of tenants as well as staff. Um, they're not things that are funded for in an individual package, but the organisation cannot operate um, if we don't do those things. Uh, that could be as simple as um, someone passing away and a whole a whole bunch of the team needing to attend, sorry, business, um, with that family. Uh, the NDIA is not funding a team of 10 people um, to do that, um, but it's an obligation. Um, it's not an optional extra. So I think we often come at this from the angle of saying that in the work that we do, culture leads the decision making. It's not a mainstream service response, and then we consider culture on top of that, mm. which is generally how the system works. Mm. Thank you. Dr Winkler, I want to turn to you for the, the final theme I'm going to address today, which is the transition out of or away from the group home model. As I said at the mm. beginning, we do have the February 2023 report about reimagining shared housing and living, and you've just you've set out in that report the six key recommendations from th this research, and I'll just read like the, the headlines if I can: a better data funding allocation, living and design, governance models, provider capability and collaboration. So they're, they're areas in which you've, you've made some recommendations based upon workshops that were held with people who currently live in group homes. I assume that it's too early to say if you've had any responses to these recommendations, it being only the 17th of February. Yeah, so look, we, we have um, some um, providers who are interested in, in working with us to kind of pro progress to a demonstration project, but, but it's very early days. Are you aware of research or work that's being done in relation to the non-SDA housing market? What opportunities for innovation and transition exist in that part of the sector? Hmm. Um, Good question. So um, I know on the Housing Hub that we list both SDA and non-SDA, but um, I'm not uh, not aware of um, any innovation around specific to disability housing in, in non-SDA. Um, yes, could I just um, comment on that? Um, as someone who's used a wheelchair and mobility aids for many, many years and had to um, and, and continued to work full time right through that period too, um, I um, only felt like I had a disability when I faced um, the built environment obstacles. And until we have a building code that provides for universal access, we are always going to face the discrimination for people living with disabilities. And, you know, we are a poorer society for, for that too. So I think we really do need to address the building codes in all states and territories and insist on much better standards of accessibility. Because if people can't get out and about, how can you see people with disabilities? How can they 
How can they function and be included in society? How can they be employed and work? It's a huge battle. And so these, these little experiments that we're doing with summer housing, our, our small contribution, it's just a tiny part of saying to society, we have to wake up. We have to say this, this society has had to stop segregating people with living with disabilities and include them and make for a richer society for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and being on the panel today. Those are my questions for you. I'll now hand you over to the chair. Thank you very much. Commissioner McEwen. Uh, my one question is for the Summer Foundation and or the uh, Summer Housing is just briefly, when you've worked with property developers and with uh, the, the construction building, construction industry, are you seeing positive signs that they actually do understand universal design or the point that you've just raised? Do you see some breakthrough? Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. We certainly do see that they um, see the the value in universal design, universal access in design. Would they sacrifice profit to um, to implement universal design? Uh, I, I know that they wouldn't. Um, you know, you cannot. We cannot rely as a society on commercial forces to solve social issues. And this is why we need organisations like Summer Housing, Summer Foundation, as not-for-profits to lead the way. We're not dependent on profit, but we can actually enter into partnerships with the commercial sector, with our investors, hard-nosed investors like Macquarie, and we can say to them, partner with us and we will show you the way to make for more better access. Thank you. Dr Winkler, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, just, um, I guess I'm very thankful that we've, um, the access to premises standards um, has been in for a decade. So that means that there is universal design in all the common areas um, of, um, say, apartment buildings. So I think that developers are used to that. And I think that um, we've worked with a lot of the kind of key major developers and um, uh, yeah, they're much more kind of aware of the need for accessible design than they were, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask uh, Summer Foundation or Summer Housing, do you, in the 400-something dwellings that you've constructed, how, do you have any information of people that may have moved from a group home yes. into your dwellings? Yes. Yes, I'd love to tell you a brief story, if I could. Um, we had... Uh, a young adult, Jason, I mean, we have many stories, I'll just give you one, um, a young adult who was <clears throat> left home and went into a group home. His parents were very concerned about it in Victoria. Um, the the a support worker was um, also um, controlled by the landlord, so the group home and the support worker were one and the same. So he couldn't and the parents couldn't make any complaints about um, the deteriorating um, his deterioration over a number of years because um, they were worried that he'd lose his access to the group home if they complained about the supports. Um, you know, it's simple things like because of his disability, he couldn't make himself a cup of coffee or he couldn't access a fridge or because bench tops are all made for OK, OK health and safety requirements made for able-bodied people, not for people living with disabilities. Um, his weight declined to 39 um, kilograms and he stopped speaking, completely stopped speaking. Then he, they, the family found summer housing <clears throat> and Jason moved into one of our apartments to live independently and in a very short space of time, he started speaking in full sentences, he put on weight again and he was so happy at being able to live um, an independent adult life. And they say, the parents say, we now treat Jason like an adult instead of a um, deteriorating child. Um, thank you for that insight. But do you, do you know the numbers? Because it's been put to us that lots of people don't want to leave their group homes. Yeah. And I'm just trying to yes. get a sense, is that because they've never had another alternative or another experience? And so I'm tr trying yeah. to see if you, if that is one of your feeder cohorts or is it mainly new generational 
change, yes. looking for different options. We have um, people coming into our, our accommodation from nursing homes. We have people coming from group homes and we have people coming from hospital and long-stay hospital. Some, sometimes we have cases of people who've been in hospital for three, you know, as, as you said, three years or more. Um, so we have a combination of all. I'm not sure what the breakdown is. Maybe Di has that information. But I think I, I do want to add, when people live in group homes and have been in group homes, it's a form of institutionalisation and it really affects people and it affects their aspiration and their um, willingness to risk trying something different. And I think for many of the carers and families and support workers of people living with disability who are in group homes as well, they're not so sure, you know, they don't live in brand new apartments. They've probably never seen inside a brand new apartment. They're also very wary about what is this going to be like? Uh, is is um, the person I love going to get the supports that they need? Um, is this going to be something that's, um, are, are they are they um, aiming too high? You know, yeah. we've been we've been giving a message to in the in our community that people with disabilities are defective; they're not worthy. So when we provide excellent accommodation that's customised, um, people don't really feel that they should be aspiring to that. And of course, then if they have to spend a year appealing um, through the SDA process, then of course it's a huge barrier as well. But I think there's a fundamental. Um, barrier for people that they don't actually feel worthy of these new buildings. Dr Winkler, do you have a sense of the percentage that are coming from those congregated or segregated environments into uh, the choice? No, I don't have anything at hand, but I'm happy to provide it. I just add to what um, when you were saying is I, I think that a lot of people living in group homes aren't aware that they have um, yeah. SDA in their plans, even if it's kind of a legacy level and they're not aware of what the alternatives are. And so they really need patient, expert and independent support to be able to explore mm. um, housing options and make a choice. One concern I really have is that um, the data that the NDA provides at the moment is largely around where people are living at the moment and we have no visibility about where people want to live, their needs and preferences. And I am really concerned that, you know, we might build social infrastructure that we're going to be left with for the next 30 years, which is kind of not based on, on good quality data. So I just think there's an urgent need for what I call, call demand activation, which is mm. um, supporting, um, building the capacity of people with disability to make an informed choice about um, their housing options, how they receive support, and then documenting that and aggregating that and making that available to the market so that we can actually um, build, um, you know, housing and, and, and new models um, of support that are kind of based on people's needs and preferences. Thank you. Thank you. I'd appreciate the uh, figures if you have yeah. some time. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I make one brief comment on that? Yeah. Is that okay? I, I would just like to highlight, I think it's really important uh, in the context of the work we do, that we need to be quite careful as a broader system in how we refer to this notion of group homes or what might be considered congregate living. Mm. Um, and the layering that we put over that about if it is or isn't good um, is not culturally informed. Um, so we just need to be very careful that when we, we're making these generalisations that it refers not necessarily to being a culturally validated opinion um, and in many cases, and we would advocate very strongly for this in the work we do, it's actually a, a far more appropriate and relevant way um, for people to remain connected. Yeah. Um, and people often will identify with culture, not with disability. Uh, and certainly, um, we have heard this, people from called backgrounds would like to live with their... I think that's Absolutely. a different nuance than the criteria just being the disability congregation that I was trying to make, but thank you very much for reminding me of that. Summer housing, uh, are all the tenants in your accommodation NDIS? Yes, they are. That, that's, a, um, that's a condition of us being SDA providers that um, we, uh, our tenants have an NDIS package and or our participants, and that they have an SDA package within their... What NDA. happens when they get to 65? Um, 
I might hand that question over to Di. I hope they're still with us when they're 65. But Di. Dr. Yeah, it's a really good question. I understood that people um, could would not be kind of um, could continue, but I guess it kind of remains to be seen how that happens. I guess the other issue is, um, yeah, as, as like people with disability do age um, prematurely. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I imagine that's a problem you're going to have to address at some stage. Yes, yeah, yeah, you're you're correct. Yeah. Um, uh, this may be connected with uh, Commissioner Bennett's questions, but do you have a breakdown of the sources of uh, the people who come to your accommodation? Some will come from group homes, and I think mm. Commissioner Bennett asked you whether some had never been in group homes, but you mentioned also that some come from long stays in hospitals. They do. How, how would they come to you? Well, they... They're in hospital for a long time. A long time. I, I've got a few stories, but um, because you know. there's no other accommodation, or because yes. they've got a long-term yes. condition, or what? Yes. Um, so you know, they may have a um, particularly complex. Um, you know, one case that that I could talk about is um, a, a man who had um, uh, who developed uh, quadriplegia and required ventilation, and so. Um, his partner couldn't manage that at home and he, they couldn't find anywhere um, where he could go. He was three years in hospital. He was only 34. Um, and then um, they heard about summer housing and it was by applying to uh, through the NDIS for NDIS support and they're trying to see if they could manage this at home and how could it work. And the support worker told them that um, summer housing had properties and um, they might like to apply and apply for an SDA, SDA package. At that stage, or only in, um, it was, uh, it's only recently that shared living was possible through an SDA package. So it wasn't possible when they applied two years ago, um, and, uh, but they thought it was better than him staying in hospital, so they applied and he moved into a summer housing accommodation, but he couldn't go with his wife. Um, and then um, only recently the SDA enabled shared living, um, and so his wife's now living with him and they've got a shared um, villa. One of our um, new, new um, innovations where um, we're trying some townhouses as well, some villas where you can have shared accommodation. Thank you very much. Thank you to each of you for uh, your contributions today. We very much appreciate them and the experiences uh, you've had and you've been prepared to share. So thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Dowsett, shall we now take uh, 15 minutes adjournment? Uh, yes, 15 minutes. It's the morning tea adjournment, so we'll have a quick we'll, morning we'll tea. We'll resume them at just 11.30 or 11.32. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms Eastman. Our next witness is Tracy Mackey, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner. Uh, Ms Mackey, thank you very much uh, for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence uh, today. We appreciate uh, your assistance and uh, the uh, rather detailed statement that you have provided, which uh, we've had the opportunity to uh, Read. Um, I, I, has uh, Ms. Mackey taken the up motion? No. In that case, would you be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate who's sitting directly opposite you, and she will administer the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence that you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, Ms Eastman. Thank you. Um, Ms Mackey, I think we've uh, introduced you on a number of occasions for the Royal Commission, and thank you for joining us. 
You've prepared two statements for this public hearing, one dated the 15th of November 2022. Do you have a copy of that? Yes, I do. And a second statement of the 3rd of February this year, 2023. I also have that. Are there any corrections to the statement? No, there are not. And are their contents true and correct? Yes, they are. So I want to turn initially to the recent publication of what is described by you as an own motion inquiry. That was an inquiry in to seven service providers and it involved a review of the note the reportable incidents notified by those service providers to uh, examine a, a range of factors why to start with why did you decide to initiate this own motion report what was the reason for it so this own motion inquiry was initiated by the former commissioner and then um, the implementation occurred. Can I ask you just to slow down, please? There's sure. no rush today. <laughs> and then the acting commissioner um, between Commissioner Head and I. Um, so this uh, own motion inquiry has um, taken quite a long time to um, come to fruition um, and we have learned a lot about how to undertake an own motion inquiry as a result of that. Um, there was um, a number of um, causes to why Commissioner Head committed to undertaking the own motion inquiry um, and I believe he presented some of those um, at a former hearing of this commission. So can I bring it forward to the publication of the report and if you have you got a copy of the report with yep. you? Page four sets out the findings and they're identified by way of dot points at the bottom of page four over to page five. And I don't want to focus on all of them, but there seem to sort of be a fairly key set of themes emerging. One was the need for specific regulation of the group home setting to enhance quality and safety of those settings for people with disability. And then related to that were a range of issues. Greater engagement with people living in group homes, the attitude and aptitude of the workforce, interaction of supported independent living and disability accommodation arrangements, so the SIL and the SDA arrangements working better, a need to better understand the supported accommodation market and how people interact with it, by improving collection, monitoring and analysis of relevant data and an interface with health and supported accommodation systems not being very effective for people in the setting. So those are the overarching uh, findings of the inquiry. You also say in the preface to the report that one of the key aims of the inquiry was to identify models of best practice for the delivery of supported accommodation that can inform the NDIS Commission's capacity building work with providers and the development of relevant practice standards and quality indicators. So the report, are we right in understanding, brings together the findings and also seeks to identify a way forward, is that right? Uh, it does, and as a part of the delivery of the report, not only do we have the core report, but we also have um, additional information, including that of um, Professor Christine Bigby, who provided um, quite a detailed literature review around um, best practice um, with, with quite detailed examination of what that best practice looked like. Well, her literature review in terms of distilling what the research said, and if I put it in a slightly layperson's perspective of what makes it good to live in a group home, in effect, was uh, around 10 factors, but she identifies active support as a sort of key aspect of that. In terms of what you've seen across the providers who were part of this inquiry, but more broadly, do you think active support is widely used across service providers? I would say that we ha still have a long way to go on the take up of active support. <clears throat> um, we can certainly see it evident um, in some services and in some providers, um, but it is one of the areas where we would like to see a lot more commitment and investment go into active support in practice. That still sounds, uh, from what you say, as a fairly soft approach to encouraging service providers to adopt active support. 
from what you have uh, seen in your time as the Commissioner, do you think there needs to be a stronger approach to active support by way of a practice standard so that it becomes mandatory in the way in which service providers deliver services? As part of releasing the Own Motion Inquiry report, we also at the same time as the Commission released an initial action plan. And that was very deliberate because we are very much committed to the Own Motion Inquiry informing what we do as the regulator in the space. Um, there are a number of, if you like, streams or, or groupings of actions that we um, are either already taking and will accelerate or um, advance on, as well as new actions. Um, some of those are around that educative um, or capacity building that you've just mentioned, um, but others are around ensuring compliance um, across um, providers of this ilk. So we are um, in the, at present developing up a campaign around compliance action for all SIL providers, um, and that's both registered and unregistered. Um, and part of that design is looking at um, where we will focus our attention. So we want to be assured of um, uh, what's being delivered and the real practice of what's being delivered. So we'll certainly be looking at the approach that providers take. On the question of practice standards, um, we have also committed mm -hmm. to developing a practice standard for SIL. Um, and we don't want to preempt where that might um, take us in terms of the design of that standard because the very first step we want to take is to engage um, people with disability who live in supported accommodation to scope out the design of that mm -hmm. standard. So um, we're still very much in the phase of implementing the report that's coming that has just come out. Um, I'm still in the phase of meeting with chairs, <coughs> CEOs, and boards about um, of those seven providers. Um, and so we're trying to move on the implementation of our action plan at the same time, but it will take us a little while to get there. Do you get a sense that as service providers think about active support, that much of the focus is very much on the frontline delivery and the management of support workers and less on understanding frontline practice leadership that requires there to be very sound uh, corporate governance structures and accountability in place in organisations. So I suppose what I'm saying is that there's two parts to this. Mm -hmm. First part is improving the capability and the quality of work at the support worker level, but also where the back end fits in. So not the front of house, but the back of house, but particularly in that corporate governance leadership area. It was very insightful in the own motion inquiry to look quite deeply at um, all of the arrangements um, across those seven providers. And what we found across the seven was the arrangements, even in terms of, for example, governance, varied significantly. Well, these are, uh, sorry to interrupt, these are the seven large providers that, in a sense, capture perhaps the largest revenue, but also a very sort of diverse um, service model, is that right? That's right. So they were chosen very carefully um, as a, a reflection of the, the, the size, um, you know, the volume of people that they support, but also um, the differing arrangements that they had. Um, so those characteristics are, are defined in the report. Um, each of the organisations um, has a number of different takeouts um, from the work that we've done in the Open Motion Inquiry. We've uh, heard over the course of this week uh, that there is interest in some areas in having uniformity of practice and standards, but when you dig a little bit deeper in terms of the way in which the service providers wish to deliver the services, their sense of their corporate or organisational culture and their uh, wish to be able to manage things like support worker training or the disciplinary functions that might arise under the way complaints are that they want to do it their own way. Have you seen any uh, tensions in trying to give the service providers sufficient freedom and autonomy to do things their way? Like we've even seen mission statements like the Melbourne way or the Afford way in the past. But 
but at the same time needing to have a coherent and uniform set of standards so as a regulator you can work to uh, enforcing standards and not try to do the sort of checks and balances around all of the different forms of um, complaint handling, training, administration. Um, I would agree that um, given the arrangements in place at the moment, it's important for us as a regulator to do two things. The first is that we continue to build the capability of this, the sector and invest in that capability. And the standards are a good way of reflecting what the minimum expectation is not where they should be aiming, mm. but the minimum, and I'm at pains to point that out regularly. So we're at the the lowest common denominator here, and that shouldn't be what you aim for. That's right. So okay. when I visit a service, I'm really interested to understand um, what they're doing to go beyond. So if you've, you know, if, if you're meeting the practice standard, um, you know, what's on what's on your agenda about continuing to understand the feedback from. Um, those you're providing supports to, understanding the feedback from your workforce, looking at best practice. Um, so I'm interested in you know, what they're doing as the next phase of evolving. Um, Are uh, you seeing much in terms of innovation and evolving to the next phase, which I assume means ongoing and continuous improvement in the delivery of quality and safe services? Uh, I certainly have seen examples where people are going beyond and um, where, you know, sometimes they're quite small things that appear very obvious but are very rare. Um, and so... Can you give me an example? Um, so Without I, naming a, a service provider but sure. just what you mean by something of that nature. So... Um, uh, I was um, meeting with a service provider in the last um, couple of weeks and um, they were talking about um, the house rules that the participants set up, not facilitated by the workforce. You know, it's their home. Um, what are they seeking to achieve in that home? And um, they were talking about how one of the rules that, because um, they wanted a set of house rules, one of those rules was that all workers and all people from who visited that weren't the residents or their families or friends had to enter the premises by the back door. So, you know, that was their rule. Um, it was a very simple rule, but they were actually being guided by the people that lived in that house mm. um, and, you know, treating it as their home rather than a workplace where it's automatic that if you're the CEO, you come in the front door and you just enter that because your workforce are in there. So um, it can be quite simple. Um, it can also be um, uh, much more um, sophisticated and nuanced in terms of trying to meet um, uh, particular needs of the participants um, in various um, service types. So a lot of what you have to do in uh, responding to complaints and incidents is very much focused on how a service provider might respond to a particular or isolated incident. Have you found that the exercise of using the own motion power and the work that you've done for this report has given you an opportunity to do a deeper analysis as to the nature, extent and causes of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation in, and the focus of this one was group homes. The Own Motion Inquiry um, has given us um, an enormous um, and very helpful and insightful guide about where to prioritise our resources um, and how we can continue to evolve all of the functions we do. So not only complaints and RIs, um, but also how we continue to evolve, for example, the capability framework. So what are those practical things that we can do as the regulator, as well as how we deliver the core functions? Do you feel in that respect that, and I mean no disrespect to anybody before your time, uh, that using this own motion power, and I know Mr Head started this, has really allowed the NDIS Commission to evolve in um, showing the broader community, service providers and people with disability, how you're going to approach your work? It's given a, do you think it's given a greater sense of transparency in how you do what you do? I think on this particular one it has, um, but one of the reasons it's been able to do that is we've had... Um, a number of years of data to be able to draw on, um, which would have been very difficult to do much earlier mm. in the life of the Commission. Um, it is, um, and I believe I expressed this when I was here last time, 
um, it is um, a commitment that I have and the executive team have at the Commission to continue to use the own motion inquiry power. Um, we publicly announced an, a, another own motion inquiry. I'm just about to ask you about oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you've very recently, I think earlier this week perhaps, uh, announced an own motion inquiry into platform providers operating in the NDIS market. And I don't know if you've been present today or in the room where we've had some evidence from uh, at least two uh, organisations that do that. If the terms of reference indicate that, just tell me if I'm right in this, that the purpose of this is to get a better understanding in the way in which platform providers work and their operations, but it's also a recognition that people with disability can and should, to the greatest extent possible, determine how services are best delivered to meet their needs and who should be delivering them. So that's that's from the terms of reference. Mm -hmm. So that's a reflection of um, it is pleasing to see that one part of the market is changing. So the um, establishment of platform providers has um, given rise to um, additional choice for um, quite a large number of NDIS participants. Um, what we're seeing is um, as more and more people choose to go down that path, we want to make sure that all of the core functions um, of the Commission are able to be flexible and agile enough to respond to those differing service delivery arrangements. Well, part of this own motion inquiry also give consideration to the extent to which the use of platform providers is contributing to the fragmentation of the way in which services are delivered and the impact on the way in which the disability support worker workforce is operating. Will you be looking at that? That may be something that comes out of the inquiry. We're just obviously having announced it on Monday. We're in the very early stages, so um, we, we, I'm not at um, liberty to talk about you know, where we're heading to. Um, certainly issues of workforce um, are raised with us through our complaints process, and um, we, do, we will make sure that we cover off um, any trends that we're seeing and look into those issues. Um, but it would be way too early for me to suggest where we might go to in terms of outlining those particular ones. Right. I just want to touch on a few topics that have arisen during the course of this week and many of which you've addressed in the statement. And the first one is the registration of service providers. So you set out at paragraph 12 in your statement the check which statement, I think it's the um, November statement. In the November statement, the criteria for registration and the registration process. At the present time, you as a regulator are in an interesting role where you have registered providers and unregistered providers. And depending on uh, the particular requirements that mean somebody has to operate their business as a registered provider, it's in effect uh, voluntary as to whether or not providers will register. One of the issues that has been raised during the course of this week is whether or not this should be uniform and that all service providers should be registered. There have been some suggestions that there could be tiers of registration, so a registration light approach. Uh, but do you have a view that all service providers should be registered, uh, particularly from a regulator's perspective? So uh, fairly early on in my tenure, it, uh, registration was, it was obvious to me that that was one of the key issues um, from a participant point of view as well as from a provider point of view. And I did hold a round table to discuss a whole range of issues around registration. Um, and uh, we've made public um, a discussion starter paper for that, as well as a write-up of the issues that were canvassed at that roundtable. Um, I, I understand that many people want to go to everything's registered or not registered, but um, I believe there are quite a number of issues that need to be unpacked um, and that it's not as simple as um, doing a yes or no answer. And you know, there are a range of examples that you can think about. Um, so one would be around allied health. Um, 
Many allied health professionals, not all, are registered by another regulator, um, but looking at how you can draw on that regulation. Um, similarly, in early childhood, many early intervention services are also registered around early childhood regulators. So looking at some of those duplicative mm -hmm. arrangements and how you can um, link into some of those, and then thinking about um, not distorting the market. So if somebody wants to choose um, a local um, service provider to do their lawns, um, you want to be able to have them choose someone from the community. And in fact, that goes to the heart of the NDIS, which was you know, giving people choice in their own community mm. to remain connected to their own community. So you don't want to preclude a range of um, service provision. Having said all of that, um, there are also um, currently, um, I wouldn't quite characterise the current arrangements as voluntary. I understand why that, um, why it might appear that well, way. So let me put it, that's a perception yes. that it's a voluntary thing. Um, but there are mm. currently criteria around who is required for mm. certain service types and then also in terms of the way in which mm. um, the plan funds are managed. So um, there are currently um, arrangements around that and part of what we explored as, as doing the registration work was whether or not those settings are right. So have we taken, for example, a risk-based approach, um, which when um, these arrangements were put in place, there was no history to draw on in terms of complaints and reportable incidents. Now there is, uh, and I think that would be useful in um, looking at the definitions of who may or may not need to be registered. Um, we've certainly provided all of the information and the work that we've done around registration to the NDIS review, um, and I anticipate that they'll look closely and deeply at these issues. You've touched on the fact that there are other regulators in the area, and you've addressed this at paragraph 38 and 39 of the November statement, and uh, it, it highlights some complexity that depending on who registers as a service provider for NDIS purposes may have implications around the various regulatory arrangements that arise in relation to charities, corporations, law, fair work laws, work health and safety laws, and then all of the national health regulation as well. Uh, we asked some questions of the service providers this week about how they manage it in terms of the various regulatory arrangements around them, and we focus mostly only on the national or the Commonwealth uh, regimes. For the most part, the large service providers said that they were managing those different regulatory requirements. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity of asking, for example, a sole trader um, who might uh, employ one or two people to assist them to do their work. Have you seen... Uh, any issues arise that create additional burdens or the red tape for the smaller providers or the sole traders? I think we've certainly been made aware um, through some of the peak bodies and also directly from some service providers of varying scale, I wouldn't say it's exclusive to the, the sole operators or the smaller ones, about the challenges they see around um, uh, what they might call regulatory burden or mm. duplication, um, and in fact, one of the um, uh, one of the things that's been on my mind to progress, and I'm happy to make the commitment that we will do it this year, um, is I want to do a, a much more expansive um, review of where that duplication and where that mm. burden sits, um, because when we get um, asked for examples, often it relates to the systems, mm. so. We've got a, you know, we would be the first to acknowledge that our system is not necessarily user friendly, um, and the ability of our system to connect um, to systems that providers have or use um, is non-existent. So, if some of those things play out, then that will help inform what we do in terms of further investment around data and digital. Um, but it will also then illuminate um, when there are where there are particular opportunities. Um, I think that you know, there are already plans in place to try and address some of the things in advance. So, for example, 
um, the aged care legislation around worker screening is mirroring um, the work, the arrangements that we have in the NDIS space. So they're using the same arrangements so that it makes it easier to be able to um, sit across both of those sectors. Is that, that, will that work involve working, for example, with the Small Business Commissioner and look at the way in which small businesses operate? Uh, I'd certainly be open to engaging with the Small Business Commissioner. Uh, the next registration topic is support workers. Mm -hmm. And we had the opportunity to hear from Dan Stubbs in terms of the Victorian model. And uh, you may be aware that we've asked service providers during the course of this week about their workers, uh, the qualifications required, the interaction with the NDIS capability framework and NDIS screening. And so the issue is, is there an appetite to move from just a Victorian model but to replicate a model of that kind to operate on a national basis? And do you think that there would be value in having a national registration scheme for support workers to enhance that um, regulatory arrangements to achieve quality and safety for people with disability receiving services in the NDIS? Um, I have been um, hearing um, or listening to some of the hearing this week um, about this particular issue. Um, as you suggest, um, I believe the Commission is quite well placed given um, that we're responsible for worker screening and we have the capability framework. What we often hear from workers is that they'd love some kind of portal where they could you know, see the training and development that they've done and just be able to build on it over time. So having some kind of central repository around even that element um, appears to be very attractive for workers in this sector. Um, if the government was to um, want to implement um, worker registration of some kind, um, certainly the Commission um, would be supportive of that being a national approach. Um, I have... Um, we, we do work quite closely um, with the Victorian scheme. Um, we have noted that it's difficult for workers in Victoria, given the overlapping of arrangements and understanding where they need to go for what, so that the easier we can make it for disability support workers to engage in the space, I think the better. Um, and lastly, I'd say we would need to do quite a lot of work on defining who is a disability support mm -hmm. worker. Um, we often use it quite generically, but really understanding, you know, who are we targeting um, around um, this particular type of initiative. That, that, sorry, may I ask some questions? That, that's a, an important point. I, I take your point about <coughs> uh, the uh, person who wants to have someone come and mow the lawns. I don't mm -hmm. suppose we're terribly interested in that situation as to whether the person has a particular certificate as long as they know how to operate a lawnmower. <coughs> but if we're talking about personal care <coughs> for people uh, who are on the NDIS. That's a rather different thing. <laughs> the concept of choice and control, <coughs> pardon me, is obviously very attractive and it's the foundation of the NDIS. It reminds me in some ways of the principles underlying freedom of contract that operated under the common law of the 19th century. It assumes an awful lot about the capacity of people, not just people with disability, the capacity of people to make decisions in their own interests. And that's because of the difficulties associated with freedom of contract. That's why we now have Unfair Contract Act. We have uh, <coughs> rules against misrepresentation. We have uh, principles relating to the unconscionability of agreements. <coughs> and I just wonder whether the <laughs> choice and control, insofar as it allows an unregulated market of service providers for personal care is running some of the risks that uh, materialise with the theory of freedom of contract over 150 years ago. Do you I, see I, the point? Absolutely. And, and I think um, uh, probably the next place I would have gone was um, the choice and control issue. Um, so we know that there's a, a tension between choice and control and regulation for people, um, you know, many NDIS participants fought very hard for the NDIS to be um, very much in their 
um, patch to be able to make these choices. And um, I'm certainly aware and have spoken with participants who make choices about their um, the disability support workers they have that are doing that personal care that you reference um, and have chosen not to have people who necessarily have qualifications and they choose not to, for example, use worker screening. Now, um, they're very um, difficult, I think, issues for us to begin to unpack. And that's why I think part of what we need to do is really think about who are we talking about in that disability worker space. I think we've now got, with the Commission, you know, more than four years in, we've got a lot of data that we can mine to actually help us understand where risk lays, um, where there are some thresholds around safeguarding, um, and where it might be important for people as a consumer, because you know, really we're talking about their right as a consumer to make a choice. But we all make choices as consumers every day around a whole different range of sectors. And we equally make some assumptions about the protections that sit for us as a consumer. So I think that's possibly where we need to take that conversation around, well, what, what's the expectation without impinging on that choice? Um, and how do we do it in a way that's respectful um, and ensures the rights of the person with a disability uh, front and centre? Yes, Ms. Eastman. Um, I'll just finish my questions in relation to the registration of support workers. Mm -hmm. So if there was a national registration scheme and a regulator in relation to support workers, would that sit do you think, well, with the NDIS Commission or does it need a different body? Um, certainly that would be a decision for government. Um, as I've mentioned, I think the Commission would be well placed given we do worker screening, we have the capability framework um, and what we hear again and again from participants, from workers and providers is that we need to try and make this really complex system as simple as possible for people to engage with. So what I do know is in jurisdictions where there are multiple regulators that have overlapping responsibilities to the Commission, that's where we get the most feedback about how difficult it is for them to understand who they go to for what. Um, and so if we can take that out of the equation, I think that would be very helpful. What would be the uh, cost consequences to the scheme if there was a national a registration scheme for support workers? Would that be something that would need to be carefully considered before any recommendations would be made? Absolutely. And so that would be the uh, doing some modelling in relation to the impact of the cost if the NDIS Commission was to become the regulator of support workers through a registration process? Regardless of whether it was the Commission or any other agency, there would need to be detailed work done on um, the arrangements and the resourcing required um, and the impact in terms of um, cost to participants. Could I put it this way? If, for example, there was to be a national registration for support workers to sit within the NDIS Commission without any additional funding or resources to meet such a scheme and the administration of that scheme, that that would have uh, some serious viability issues. We would have to take decisions about what core functions we um, either reduced or, or ceased um, to be able to take on an additional significant core function of that ilk. Well, on the topic of your work on complaints, at paragraph 97 of your statement, you say that the NDIS Commission's current complaint handling processes and systems are unable to deal with the volume of complaints that it receives. Um, that statement, I think, is a, a fairly significant, perhaps, admission uh, as to the NDIS struggling to meet the demands in responding to complaints. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. So um, the Commission was provided funding when we were established. Um, as we know, over that time, the um, number of participants has increased beyond um, what was forecast. Um, the Commission um, is not a demand-based um, funding um, model, so therefore our capacity um, to deliver against um, how we are funded um, is in quite challenging and we um, continue to work with government on that. Well, it seems just from uh, hearing the evidence this week is that the approach to what might constitute a complaint or 
a, a, not a reportable incident to the NDIS Commission is when in doubt, just make the notification. And that rather than the Commission being a place of last resort or the place where there is no other avenue for addressing the incidents and complaints that they're coming to to your commission. Uh, is that what is that the reason that you're seeing such an increase and in being unable to meet and deal with the volume of complaints? Um, so we have seen an increase in complaints, as I've mentioned, because we've got a, a larger number or population of people um, who are NDIS participants. We've also seen the diversification of the market. Um, we've also seen uh, quite a number of reviews occur um, across the NDIS. Um, I believe when I started, it was somewhere around 18 in number. Um, and um, we've also had, for example, the likes of the Royal Commission, all of those are giving us information and seeking for us to um, respond in an increasing way. And so when there hasn't been that increase, um, that is when the challenges arose. At the same time, um, we've seen the maturity of the market around regulation. So if we just looked, for example, at reportable incidents, we now have more reportable incidents from more providers. And that's because people are beginning to understand the requirements and are much more compliant around reporting what they need to. Um, we're also getting um, uh, streamlining as much as we can um, all of our arrangements around things like reportable incidents. So we've done a major review. Um, and as part of doing that, we look at trends. So we can tell if a provider is over-reporting or under-reporting, given their size and um, scope of activities that they undertake. So we do very much engage with them. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's because there's a lot of over-reporting that that's where the challenge is arising from. With respect to complaints, is one way to address the uh, issues that or the burdens that arise for the Commission is that the providers themselves have more robust and effective complaint handling systems that operate at a local level? We certainly know from our complaints team, which has um, uh, undertaken a significant reform process uh, over the last um, six months or so, that uh, a very significant proportion of the resolutions um, to complaints um, is that um, we basically facilitate um, communication between the provider and the participant or the provider and their family. Well, so we, should that really be your function? Look, it should if people are not comfortable mm. or, or feeling like they don't have the ability to raise issues directly with the provider. But it also tells us that we've got more to do around building that capability of providers to give people an opportunity to raise things that might not, um, you know, when we say complaints, it, it can be anything from something very significant and severe to actually people wanting to express a preference mm. and not having an opportunity to do that. So we need to find ways in which we can build the capability of providers to offer those opportunities, not just in their complaint handling processes, mm. but also in the way they engage with um, everyone they support. Should the overall um, objective here be, Yes, we encourage people to make complaints so that there's a culture of raising concerns or issues as you need. Absolutely. But essentially, it's not building very elaborate pathways to and processes in relation to those complaints. It's really about using the complaints that are coming to identify what could be done at a preventative level and keep that focus on prevention rather than build very elaborate complaint handling systems with elaborate investigative teams and elaborate processes for investigating and elaborate report writing. And we've seen that the investigation process sort of takes over what the sort of primary purpose of the complaint might be. How, I mean, is that a concern that you've seen? And if so, what do you think service providers might like to turn their minds to in relation to their complaint handling systems? So I think the own motion inquiry for us really um, bore out some of those issues. So of the seven providers, we saw some with um, more mature and um, you know, really person-centred arrangements around complaints, and we saw others that um, certainly had um, room to improve. Um, 
for those that have those processes that we thought were um, uh, more fit for purpose, they were around doing two things with every complaint. One, resolving the complaint as quickly as possible um, with the person front and centre in mind, not with the organisation's risk um, in mind. And second of all, that they're you know, using the data that they gather from complaints to inform the way they deliver services, the way they engage with participants, the way they develop policies. So they, they've got those two-pronged things um, always occurring. One follow-up question uh, from uh, our discussion of PH26, which was the homelessness hearing, is I asked you on that occasion whether or not you turned your mind to whether the powers in the Act would empower you to order a provider to make redress in certain circumstances. And I, my recollection is you said that you were getting some advice and considering that. Can you give me an update on where you are on the question of redress? I can. So um, I'm pleased that as we've been doing the work around improving the way we handle complaints and we respond to complaints, that um, it is now very much a feature um, in the way in which we're working to resolution of complaints, that um, if the participant or the complainant, um, for example, would like an apology, would like a refund, would like services reinstated, whatever that um, might be, um, that that is absolutely part of the process that is considered. Um, and so that, that that's become sort of part of the way we work in that space. Um, the other thing that we are pursuing is I've asked my new um, general counsel to look at the use of enforceable undertakings. Um, it's not a um, tool that the Commission has yet used, yet we have um, the ability to um, put in place enforceable undertakings. Um, it's certainly my experience in previous regulator roles that they can be incredibly effective, um, including making sure that there is um, the right arrangements around um, reflecting the impact that has occurred as well as preparing for um, future arrangements of the same ilk. So we're currently working in that space as well. Right. Next topic is community visitors, and you've addressed this in the statement at paragraph 222 and following and at, par at paragraph 224, you say that you support a national community visitor scheme uh, that sits within the commission, but you say that ultimately this is a question for the Australian government, which I think reflects Mr Head's evidence at public hearing 14, from my recollection. That's correct. Uh, some uh, jurisdictions at a state level have community visitor schemes that have been operating over a long period of time. One feature of those community visitor schemes is that they're not limited to NDIS participants and that they may capture a sort of broader area in terms of uh, people with disability. What, in your view... Uh, needs to be considered in moving to a national scheme first? And then second, how do you ensure that a move to the national scheme that would have predominantly a focus on NDIS participants uh, addresses the circumstances of other people with disability who are not participants who may well benefit from community visitors in relation to their engagement in their particular settings or with particular individuals. Have you thought through that? Um, we have done some um, limited work in the space and Commissioner Head um, certainly commenced that work during his um, time at the Commission. Um, in... Um, in developing up things like our regulatory strategy over the last um, 12 months and thinking about how we continue to evolve, particularly as we want to think about putting the rights of people with disability front and centre in our decision making and informing even our approach to what we do, it's, it's clear to me that one of the elements um, that uh, is not as strong as in other regulatory systems is the ability to monitor. 
So the way in which we monitor is a proxy through complaints and RIs um, rather than a program of monitoring. Um, that would often be um, a significant element of uh, you know, other regulatory systems. Um, by doing monitoring, you could um, certainly look at and engage with, undertake um, a version of a visitor scheme um, or outreach, and there's a range of other terms people are using in that space. Um, I do think um, having had engagement with community visitors arrangements across the states and territories that do have those arrangements, that it would be helpful for participants and for um, stakeholders, you know, advocates and disability representative organisations to have a nationally consistent approach in this space. Um, hence why um, we've held the view that it would be helpful um, for the Commission to step into that space. I fully acknowledge that there are um, a range of schemes that have been around for a very long time. Um, I would say that they have differing levels of ability to be able to fulfil what we would view as a monitoring arrangement. Um, and indeed, there are attributes of some of those schemes that seem to work better than others. Do you think if there was a, a national community visitor scheme that a piece that would work well with community visitors is also a, a clear national approach to supporting and funding advocates? And I don't know if you heard the evidence earlier this week on Monday from the advocates about the great um, demands for advocacy services and those demands not being met. I didn't hear the evidence on Monday, um, but I was given some briefing from the team about it. And um, advocates have, um, I've certainly been in a number of fora where advocates have raised issues. We had a advocacy forum in November last year with more than 200 advocates. And despite us not being the funder for advocacy, um, we're certainly conscious of the significant role that advocates can play. Um, we work closely with our colleagues in the Department of um, Social Services around what those requirements are. Um, and indeed, at present, I'm talking to a particular um, advocacy organisation um, because we found there are some niches that are just not covered for or provided for at the moment um, where we can see it would be incredibly helpful for those supports to be in place. It, coming back to the questions that I asked you about complaints and the overwhelming number of complaints, mm -hmm. would you agree that effective advocacy and support for people with disability with an advocate could well be uh, something that might minimise the number of complaints that then have to make their way to your commission? And if so, would that not be a very significant investment by government in terms of uh, managing the number of complaints? That is possibly the case, but not having particularly looked at the numbers in that way, um, I'd be hesitant to say it is. Do you know in government whether uh, there has been any modelling in looking at what might be the investment in advocacy to assist people use the NDIS, assist people in the resolution of complaints and concerns? Do you know if there's been any modelling in looking at the effectiveness of good advocacy into the scheme? I don't know if I would describe it as, as modelling, but I'm certainly aware of work that's been occurring um, and our colleagues in DSS are... So that's uh, a DSS it's work a DSS. that's happening. Okay. Now, I want to ask you one question about restrictive practices and the data provided to the Royal Commission has indicated a significant increase in the use of authorised restrictive practices between 2021 and then 21-22. So just if I give you the raw numbers, you might want to have this in front of you, is it, in terms of the total numbers of the use of restrictive practices in the period July 2020 to 30 June 2021, there's 3 million 677, 132 restrictive practices record, like recorded in your data. For the following financial year, it's 5 million, 579, 139 practices recorded. Over those years, there is also an increase in the number of participants recorded in the order of about 1,400. I've just rounded that up. So assuming that there has been an increase in participants, 
but the numbers between, again, I'll round up around three and a half million up to five and a half million use of restrictive practices, and these are authorised restrictive practices. Uh, can you give the Royal Commission any sense as to why this is occurring and what are the reasons for the increase? Can I just check um, the document that has those figures? I've written um, the figures down, but I, I just want to make sure so that I'm... it was it's in response to an NTG, but I don't have the number of the NTG. Is it the February one? I'll turn that up for you. Okay. I've just got the raw numbers. Okay. So you said the increase in number of participants recorded was in the order of 1,400. That doesn't sound right. Oh, this is actually in your statement. Sorry. Okay. It's given the number without that reference. So if you turn to your statement from February. February, yep. Yeah, sorry about that. It's at page 40. 136. Yep. Yep. Okay. And it's the chart that accompanies paragraph 135. So it's the top of the page on page 40. Okay. So the question well, is, can you give us an explanation for that, what seems to be a significant rise? So during the period of time between 2020 and 2022, we saw the full transition of states and territories um, to come under the arrangements that the Commission has. Um, so there's a growth in participant numbers in real terms um, and therefore the number of people that will be subject to restrictive practices as part of a behaviour support plan. At the same time, we also know um, that we have an increased number of plans being lodged with the Commission. So we've got visibility of these figures. We also know that we've got um, a much higher level of compliance um, from providers around reporting these arrangements, um, which we don't have early on. So it takes some time even when states transition. So we're still working, for example, with providers in Western Australia um, who seem to be lagging with the reporting around a range of things, including um, uh, restrictive practices. So these increase in numbers, um, uh, although quite significant, as you point out, um, are not necessarily related to an increasing use, rather mm. an increasing number of participants and increase in the reporting of those. And having said that, I don't at all want to downplay the significant issue mm. that we have across this country around the use of restrictive practices, whether authorised or unauthorised. Um, we are doing a range of things to try and reduce that number um, and uh, Certainly in all of my conversations with um, other government agencies and um, state and territory governments um, is around how we work together to reduce these restrictive practices. So my last question is really to give you an opportunity, if you wish, to respond to what a number of service providers have said over the course of this week, and that is that they would like to see more guidance material from the NDIS Commission on best practice on how uh, certain aspects of their management of their workforce, workforce might be addressed and also the suggestion that there needs to be some central repository. We did hear from Ms Lee and the work that NDS is doing for its members. Some of that material NDS is doing is free and publicly available, but others is available to members only. Uh, do you have a view as to whether the uh, QSC becomes akin to a centre of excellence in building a repository of best practice material and guidance material? And in effect, that would be building on the work that you've done with Professor Bigby in terms of the active support and her review. So I just you, you may not be able to answer that, but I, I got a strong sense that there was the service providers looking to the QSC as this is the place that should give us mm -hmm. all of the information and the answers and guidance on what we should do. Do you have a view about 
the role of the QSC in that? Um, so I think there is an opportunity for the Commission to um, play a role in identifying and sharing good practice, um, not to the point where we're templating what needs to happen, because if we do that, we're not respecting the fact that there are around 580,000 NDIS participants, all of whom have um, different rights, different choices that they make. Um, so in stepping into the space, um, one of the things that we're about to kick off later this month is we're going to do a very regular update around good practice. Um, we've got a couple of ideas for the first edition. They're going to be very short and sharp, and we are sharing that um, with everyone that um, we have communication with. Um, we've also already got an enormous amount of information on our website, which we did upgrade last year to make it easier to navigate. So not only is there the capability framework, um, but even in the capability framework, um, there are lots of additional resources around research, around good practice and examples of good practice. And equally in our behaviour support space, there's an enormous volume of resources. Um, we also have the opportunity to fund um, grants. Um, we've done quite a few with um, NDS, as you mentioned. They are usually the free resources that are provided. Um, so, for example, we've done grants around supported decision-making. Um, so when we do those grants, it is our expectation that they will be provided um, free of charge um, to the sector or to participants, um, to whoever it is they're targeted at. We do recognise that um, in um, now doing that grant process for a number of years, um, we probably need to be the repository of that information. So we tried to look at the arrangements in place initially by letting um, a range of the grantees provide it separately, but we now know we need to also provide that ourselves. If you, if you did that, does that also provide a, a real opportunity for developing co-design and inclusive design and bringing people with disability in to work on uh, those standards and guidelines so that very much comes from the perspective of the people receiving services rather than what the organisations or providers need to do to make sure that they limit their risk or limit their exposure to liability? Would there be an opportunity in the way in which you would do that that brings the voice of people with disability in but also engages and builds the capability within the disability sector that people have those opportunities. It would absolutely be my expectation if, that, you know, as we do more and more in this space, um, that it's clear that um, we're engaging with and responding to what participants are telling us and asking us um, and requiring in terms of the services and supports they receive. All right. Uh, Ms Mackey, thank you. I feel like I've done a rapid fire at you about 10 different topics, but I'm grateful for your evidence today. Thank you. Sure. Do you have any questions? Uh, one question. Thank you, Ms Mackey. In relation to the question Ms Eastman asked about advocacy support, do you agree with the proposition that advocacy support is important for disabled people, particularly, particularly, <coughs> excuse me, particularly those who may not have family or informal support, and that that support should be adequately or inappropriately funded? So certainly advocates um, play a key role for many participants and um, sometimes they're of the um, cohort that you've just mentioned and other times they can have quite different characteristics. Um, so uh, we certainly value and that's why we do the um, uh, advocacy forum and do quite a lot of work with advocates throughout the year. Thank you. Commissioner Bevan. Uh, thank you, but no, thank you. Can you uh, help uh, uh, interpret that chart on page 40 of your uh, February statement? It refers to, uh, if you look at the column uh, in the first chart following paragraph 135, on the right-hand side, the number of participants is 8242 and occasions of use 5.3 million. Does that imply that for each participant there was an average of six or seven hundred per annum? So for some participants, for example, with the use of chemical um, restrictive practices, yeah. there might be three or more uses of a chemical restraint each day. 
So the, the volume of restrictive practices can be very significant for one individual. Um, what we do find, and we've done some targeted work around restrictive practices, um, where we've looked at um, those participants that are subject to the most regularised yes. restrictive practices. Um, we looked at the what's called the group of 200, um, and we've worked our way through that group. We're now working through the next group. Um, so that there are um, sig there is significant use of restrictive practice across yeah, Australia. Well, we can see that at the next table where we see that the chemical restraint in 2021 to 2022, mm -hmm. there were 5,430 participants and nearly 3 million occasions of a use, uh, which uh, rather suggests between 500 and 600 per person. Right. But then when we go down to the next one, we see the mechanical restraint, 1,266 and 279,000. So uh, that rather suggests uh, something like 230 uses of mechanical restraint per person per annum. What's a mechanical restraint that gets into that column? <laughs> Um, so our senior practitioner um, is probably best placed and I believe he's provided um, quite detailed um, information to the Commission and I'm happy to. Um, We've probably had the information yeah. previously but it just struck me looking at the table. Yeah. Uh, when you look at all of them, they're quite stark um, mm. and um, unfortunately what we also find is the same participant is likely to be subject to multiple restraints, um, very regularised. But... Um, uh, we do have a table that's quite easy to understand that talks about um, each of the different types of um, practices and examples of those, which might be quite helpful. Thank you. I'm in favour of simple tables. Thank you very much for your uh, assistance. Uh, we very much appreciate and the very detailed information, again, that you have given and uh, that we have received in the uh, in the past from the NDIS Commission. So thank you very much. Ms Eastman, shall we resume at 1.30? Yes, thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Uh, yes, Ms. Eastman. Our final witness for this hearing is Jerry Mitra, and she is the General Manager, Provider and Market Development at the NDIA. I think you need to do your oath or affirmation. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh, Ms. Mitra, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission again to give evidence, I think. Uh, we appreciate your assistance. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, who's seated opposite you, uh, she will administer the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yes. Uh, Ms Eastman will now ask you some questions. So good afternoon, Ms Mitra. Thank you for joining us. You've prepared a statement for this public hearing dated the 19th of December. You have a copy with you? I do. And you've provided us with a Cori agenda and that is dated the 14th of February and there are some amendments to paragraph 17 and also just replacing a typographical error in paragraph 134. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And other than those amendments, the contents of your statement are true? Yes, that's right. And uh, I understand that you've been following some but perhaps not all of this public hearing. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So I want to ask you a few questions arising from your statement but reflecting what the Royal Commission has heard over the course of the week. The first issue is the growth of the workforce. When the uh, NDIA, sorry, NDIS commenced, there was an expectation that there would need to be a significant growth in the workforce to support people with disability as we move to the models of support under the NDIS. 
To what extent has the NDIA done ongoing research and modelling to think about the workforce demands into the future? Um, the NDIA um, works closely with DSS, who's been responsible for developing the workforce strategy um, for the care sector and in mm. particular for the disability workforce. So we've worked alongside DSS to understand some of the modelling. They've led mostly, though, in that work. So does it remain the case that um, at, even at this stage of the life of the NDIS and the establishment of the NDIA, that for the most part the policy work concerning the NDIS remains with the department or DSS, is that right? That's correct, particularly for workforce. Right. I want to turn to another issue which was raised towards the beginning of the week, and that was the issues uh, concerning the disability workforce and what work is funded and what work is not funded. So I don't know whether you heard Ms Riddell's evidence at all. I only heard part of that. So she told the Royal Commission that support workers don't get any funding for non-direct care hours. And she said when the NDIS prepare the roster of care, uh, only supervisors get admin hours and all workers are funded for the hours precisely from when the residents are awake at home or needing support. Mm. And she said, if the person with disability does not need direct support in those hours or are away from their home, then the support workers don't get funded for the hours. And she said, this means that you have to choose between admini the administration work that you have to do and the requirements of your job when the resident is there. So she made that observation about being able to perform the duties that include administrative requirements and ad administrative work, but the implications in terms of being funding. So she addressed that. That's page 106 from line 18 in the transcript and in her statement at paragraph 28 and 29. Now, Mr McFarlane also, in his statement at paragraph 17 and 35, uh, said that the NDIS cost model and pricing cap is based on award minimum pay and condition conditions and that there was funding only up to the, the cap identified in the award. The combination of these two things meant that there is a, a very tight arrangement that needs to be made in the way in which support workers do their job. Now, am I right in understanding, looking at your statement, if you turn to uh, starting at paragraph 14, and then when we get to paragraph 19, you say, for the time spent on general training and upskilling of staff, as well as administrative activities, the NDIS price limits include an allowance for overheads of these items, but as but you say as such they would not be deemed claimable under the current settings. So I just want to understand, based on what you say in the statement, is to what extent is the administrative work, the form fillings required of support workers the documentation in relation to what the activities might have been for somebody during the course of the day. Is that work unfunded from the NDIS perspective? So in short, no, it's not unfunded. Um, and there's probably two points that might help to clarify that, if that's helpful. Um, the first is that um, the... The price limits are a fully loaded hourly rate. So um, they are not based on the minimum wage of the SHADS award. They're actually based on, um, and, and I've got this in one of my attachments, which is the disability support cost worker model. Mm -hmm. So you do have all of this for you, but they assume the SHADS classification of 2.3, so not at the bottom. Um, but, but just only at 2.3, but not above that. Uh, so th that's an average. So we pay 
the, the hourly rate that we, or the, the price limit for the hourly rate is the same for everything. So Regardless we're Regardless of whether somebody's in a casual position, part-time or full-time? No, no, um, all of the loadings for casual and all of the loadings for um, different shifts at different times of the day mm. are included. Um, but I think what's probably important to understand in terms of the overhead component is that so if you take, for example, the, the, the lowest hourly rate, $32.36, that a worker at that level would be paid, and then you add on all of the things that are required to be paid under the award for leave and other things, takes us up to $43.86. And our price limit is actually $62.17, which includes 26%, oh, sorry, 21.6% for operational overheads. So for every hour worked, another $9 is paid to the provider for operational overheads. And then there's another amount of 12% for corporate head overheads and another 2% for right. management. And in terms of what then seems to be the disparity in what you've described and the experience of uh, the union through its members and for Ms Riddell's experience, is how do you account for that? What do you think is going on? Um, uh, it's a good question because I think the other... Uh, um, I think perhaps understanding what we are paying for, we are expecting that um, a provider who's operating efficiently is employing a, a qualified worker or somebody who is capable of doing the job. A competent worker is probably a better way of putting it. Okay, so pause there. Yeah. So I know you're in mid-sentence. Yeah. But what do you mean? Do you mean by qualified or competent, somebody with a particular qualification no, or Cert 3? No, that they are capable of operating at that level, of providing the appropriate work. And for capable, yeah. uh, do you expect that somebody would have the skills to meet the NDIS capability worker frameworks? They would have the skills to be able to perform the job that uh, the participant is buying for their support. And to have that capability, do you accept that they would need training to develop those capabilities? So we think that the amount that the funding model um, allows for is enough for them to maintain their skills. On what basis do you say we think that's enough? Uh, based on the work we've done with... Well, it's, um, so based on the work that we've done assessing and understanding the kinds of operational and corporate overheads that organisations pay. So we pay... We do pay the base amount that you know the, what the award requires a, a, a provider to pay their worker, and then on top of that, we've loaded the hourly price limit so that people, can, the organisations, have enough to pay for their operational overheads, which includes training and maintaining skills, as well as enough to manage the corporate overheads, things like claiming. And then on top of that, a margin. There's also, is there not an expectation that the capability and skills of workers will improve and increase over time, but the funding model doesn't match the increase and the increased level of skill and capability? Would you agree with that? Uh, so let me put it this way. If I was looking at it just through the lens of the award, yeah. I might say at an entry level, if we work at that level of, I think you said 2.4, 2.3. 2.3, that you would hope as a person learns on the job, undergoes training, undergoes performance evaluation, builds the skills in terms of performing their duties, that the approach is that they would then increase their pay point level as they go through. Yeah. But because you're applying an average, it brings everybody down. So it doesn't create an incentive, does it, in, in increasing and improving capability um, and skills? So there's probably a couple of ways <laughs> to explain that, and I really appreciate it. Is It can come across quite complex. Um, uh, so we, when we say we pay an average for this is the sort of the lowest rate that we pay because there is a second rate, the higher intensity rate, and um, there's also... Um, uh, an opportunity to claim for non-face-to-face -face time in particular circumstances. Um, but we're not saying that the employer should be paying at that rate. We're saying that's the average we pay. If they have a, um, a beginning staff member who is on the level one of the Shads Award, they might pay that. Others, they might be paying 2.4. So um, 
it's an average in the sense that across their workforce, um, the, the most that they can claim would allow for that, and that's part of the work that we do with our financial benchmarking and our consultation with the sector helps us to set those rates. Can I ask you just what you mean in paragraph 21, where, as you say, the NDIA does not have a direct relationship, contractual or otherwise, with providers as it relates to the agreed provision of supports and services. And then you say this, any non-face-to-face -face activity should be negotiated and agreed between the participant and the provider as part of a service agreement in line with the pricing arrangement. So you see that? Yep. Uh, are we right in understanding that what sits in that assumption is one, a capacity for the participant and the provider to negotiate? Secondly, that the participant would have knowledge about where the skills gaps would be within the provider and the training required to be done by the support worker who the provider will um, organise for them. It seems, to, it seems to put a lot of expectation on the participant having a very comprehensive knowledge of the provider to know the deficiencies at the provider end, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but the deficiencies at the provider end, and then negotiate almost on behalf of the provider so that the provider will be able to do the training, do the supervision, do the admin work and the like. Is that the assumption that lies behind that sentence? No, it might be perhaps better if I explain it in a different way. Um, so this is additional non-face-to-face -face time on top of the hours that somebody works and it is for particular um, unusual circumstances that may have occurred. So, for example, somebody might need some additional training there. Um, uh, the way their services are being delivered needs to change. There's some additional requirements um, and therefore uh, non-face-to-face time can be claimed on top of the face-to-face -face time. But how, how do you work out whether you need to claim something on top of? So um, this would occur as part of the planning process where um, a planner would work with and understand the complexity of the person, their needs and their likelihood for additional support. It, it could be, though, for example, um, and all that the participant needs to do is agree that from time to time there may be the need for non-face-to-face -face activities. But it could be, for example, that there's been an incident during the day and a worker needs to um, share information with a second worker and the provider at that point can claim for both workers to have that time to um, work through whatever's happened through a day. So those are sort of the irregular supports. The reason we... Um, say that it must be agreed between the participant and the provider is that there is an agreement that from time to time there may be a need to claim for additional hours that are not face-to-face. -face. But that's not what's included in the, um, the fully loaded rate, which is for the, the general ongoing maintenance of skills. Do you think there needs to be greater clarity and guidance on these areas which are, might be the sort of exceptions or the add-ons? We've been doing a lot of work over time to simplify the pricing arrangements and to try to make sure that they're well understood by both providers and participants. From listening to the evidence that you have over the course of this week, do you think that that is the case, that it's well understood? Uh, from listening to the evidence this week, I think um, there will be an opportunity for us to continue to explain how the pricing guide works or the pricing limit works. All right. So this takes me to support coordination. I don't yep. know whether you followed the evidence of Mr yep. Harper this this week. Yep. And you've addressed support coordination at paragraph 92 of your statement. And you say in paragraph 92, as part of the commitments under the participant serv service improvement plan, the NDIA committed to be clearer about support coordination services and what participants should expect. So you see, you've said that to us. Mm. So that suggests that this is another area where there might not be the clarity in understanding mm. the role <coughs> and the responsibilities of support coordinators and the nature of support coordination. Do you agree with that? Uh, so we've again, this is an area where we have uh, our 
paper that we've got on our website published and we've done a lot of training on it, which is about supporting support coordinators to understand their role. Um, so we think we've done a lot more work on making that clearer. Um, it is true that at the last annual price review, um, a recommendation was made that we need to further clarify roles and responsibilities. It's an area that's grown rapidly and we do get uh, anecdotal feedback from participants about the variable quality of support coordination. So it's part of the challenge that, that the role of the support coordinator and the boundaries of the responsibility are not necessarily clear or agreed. So, for example, that there may be an expectation that the support coordinator also has to be the person's advocate and has to advocate on their behalf? No, I think we're very clear on that. The support coordinator is an NDIS provider and uh, are not able to be an advocate for the participant. But my, my uh, question is, do you think, though, in terms of what's actually happening out there in the broader world, that that um, clear distinction or that boundary as to responsibilities is not so clear and that the expectation of support coordinators and in some cases support coordinators themselves step in and take on an advocacy role. Uh, I can't speak to how many are actually doing that, but I think this is an area where we are very clear in all of our documentation and in our training that support coordinators should not step across into the role of advocate. And we've we've done quite a bit of work to educate well, support how, coordinators. How do you regulate that. that then? Well, again, we do, <laughs> we, um, the regulation of that um, may happen, well, wouldn't happen obviously through us, um, Through it would be through the commission if somebody has overstepped the boundary. We do include on our website um, a series of questions for support coordinators to sort of help them consider are they stepping over the line um, because it's, it, you know, it is something that um, would be relatively straightforward to occur. All right. I, I want to now turn to uh, an issue which was touched upon this morning but uh, has been an issue that the Royal Commission has considered throughout its life and that is particularly with, and I'll just use the shorthand group home model, yep. is whether in a contemporary Australia and an Australia that is focused on promoting the rights of people with disability, that the traditional group home model is ripe to be phased out. So this is a, a question that's been raised in the course of the Royal Commission's work. And we asked you about that as question four, so it's page 11 of your statement. And your response to us is to tell us about the NDIA corporate plan 2022 to 2026. And you referred to what you describe as a number of aspirations that relate to a market transition away from traditional group home models in support of newer and more innovative service models. And then you set out the aspirations in the balance of that paragraph, and in paragraph 73, you say the NDIA recognises that some participants face a number of challenges to achieve their home and living goals. All right, so just sort of setting the scene there. Uh, when uh, you say that there are these aspirations, are there any targets in terms of achieving the aspirations during the period of the corporate plan 2022 to 2026? Not yet. Uh, not yet in terms of a set target. We are in the process of finalising through an extensive co-design process, which I've outlined in my statement. We are in the process of designing a framework and an implementation plan to support that framework, and I anticipate that we will then um, establish some uh, targets and timelines for some of the things that we intend to do. And what are some of the things that you intend to do? So I've outlined those here as well in terms of um, working closely with participants to um, better understand how to support people to make more choices into contemporary living. Um, we've what, got what does that, sorry, what does that actually mean? Is the focus on, in a sense, building capacity in the people with disability to say what they want 
or is the focus actually on saying let's provide a wide range of options for people with disability and we need to start developing them sooner rather than later? Yeah, I, th I think it's probably both, although I might word the first um, slightly differently. It is supporting people to uh, consider what options are available and to think about what sorts of choices they might want to right, make. Let me put it another way. That seems to have a very much a focus on what's the present arrangement and thinking about people who are presently living in group homes. And Ms Riddell made a comment about this in her evidence that for some people who have known nothing but institutional yeah. living and living in a group home, yeah. that they may not be the cohort of people who are looking at other options. Mm. But isn't the very nature of the work that you need to do is thinking about the future. So what about our 10-year-olds, our 16-year-olds, mm. our 20-year-olds, young people yeah. with, with disability and what they want? How have you started to think about the future for young people, not just responding to those yeah. who are immediately in, have lived in group homes? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get you. Yeah, no. Tell and me, where's the future and the innovation in this? The few, the, absolutely. The future is on designing new models that provide choices and in particular on taking um, a life stages approach, which is, I think, what you're referring to with those young people who are 16, 17, 18 looking to explore what options are there to move out of home. So, But, but a 16 or 17 or 18-year-old probably says, right, I might be with my parents for a while. Yep. Then I might actually like support to live it, at a college at university. So that will be my home. That's yep. not a group home. And then they might want to live with friends. And then they might want to live by themselves. Yep. So try to understand how is this forward thinking actually reflecting the life course of a person with disability yeah. rather than just thinking about what the sort of bricks and mortar might look like. Yeah. So what work are you doing in that regard? Yeah. So um, the co-design on the framework is a key part of that because that's exactly what we've heard through that process. The individualised living options that we've been working through and introducing um, is another part which definitely provides a very individualised mechanism to enable people to think about the kinds of uh, places that they might want to live and who they might want to live with. That's particularly um, so for uh, people who want to share with a housemate and that is a completely different way of thinking about a service. And, and, and in the attachments, um, we've also referred to the work that the Independent Advisory Council have done mm -hmm. on looking and considering about the many different options that are there. How has a, a human rights uh, perspective uh, influenced the way in which this work the consultation, the thinking, the planning, how has that influenced that work? I think, I think very much so. It is a very much been about um, uh, a, a person's right to choose for themselves where they will live and who they will live with. Have um, you, in the course of that work in the NDIA, given consideration to the guidelines on deinstitutionalisation published by the, com the com committee overseeing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability that was released on the 9th of September 2022. Are you aware of that? I'm not specifically aware of that document, no. So those guidelines suggest that state parties should abolish all forms of institutionalisation, end new placements in institutions and refrain from investing in institutions and that institutionalisation must never be considered as a form of protection mm for persons with disability or, in inverted commas, a choice. Mm. And the notion of institutionalisation is not just being in a large institution, but it picks up um, the way in which a person lives and the extent to which congregate living or shared arrangements or paternalistic approaches to service provision or supervision in living arrangements mm would be the features of institutionalisation. Is that something that you've looked at? I haven't specifically looked at that document. Right. So that's um, for reference. It's called the Guidelines on Deinstitutionalisation, Including Emergencies, and it was released by the committee on the 9th of September, and its CRPD reference number is CRPD slash C slash 27 slash 3. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Can I move to another topic? And uh, that is the effective monitoring and information sharing for NDIS participants who are at a heightened or elevated risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. This is a topic that we have um, asked the NDIA about on a number of occasions, including Mr Hoffman's evidence at public hearing 14. Can you give us a, an update on what uh, approach the NDIA is taking to effectively monitoring and any information sharing for participants who are at a higher or elevated risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation yes. in the recipient as recipients of services? Yeah. So um, since public hearing 14, we have worked with the Commission um, to develop a, a new operational protocol to, ident to better identify and jointly identify participants who are vulnerable and at risk. Um, that protocol was signed off last July and there is a group working a meeting regularly to work through and the sort of implementation process of that. Um, in addition to that, we've developed a safeguarding policy, which is just working its way through um, board approval process and will soon be published, which will have an, a further implementation plan sitting underneath it. And since um, uh, Mr Hoffman's statement, we've also um, finalised the work on um, real-time access for the Commission to access data on participants and providers so that they don't need to go through a process of, of making a request. Um, can I also say that uh, the, the other thing that's happening with regards to identification of participants who are vulnerable and at risk is our new business system, which is currently being trialled in Tasmania. Um, and will then be rolled out once that trial's uh, finalised and we've made any adjustments necessary. But that gives us the ability now to capture um, in one place all of the data that we have about somebody. So it allows us to better identify risk and then flag for outbound uh, participant check-in calls. So it will allow us to be quite proactive, including picking up the things that were in the Robertson Statement uh, uh, review around people who live alone, and people who have a sole provider. Right. One uh, aspect of people who may uh, be characterised as in that vulnerable participants framework are people who have found that they require a guardian to be able to navigate and work with the NDIA or their support coordinators or service providers. This is an issue that we addressed at Public Hearing 30 with Mr McNaughton and Dr Bennett. And one of the issues there was the extent to which the NDIA has a role in supporting practices around good supported decision making with respect to it being able to engage with the NDIA, whether it be in understanding agreements, in the forms of communication and the way in which the choice and control can be exercised in practice. Yeah. Are you able to give us an update on the work of the NDIA in relation to supported decision-making guidelines or assistance for the broader community, but service providers in particular? Yeah. Uh, so, again, that's the work that uh, Dr Bennett's been leading who and uh, a significant piece of co-design work undertaken by the agency. The supported decision-making policy is also now in final uh, stages. The board, I think, has actually approved that one and it will move to publication shortly. So um, very recent piece of work in terms of finalising it, a very strong piece of work that we're looking forward to producing. One uh, other issue which we've raised with the NDIA over time is who is the provider of last resort? and where state governments and territory governments have stepped away in many cases from being the provider of last resort. Uh, I'm interested to know whether, for example, the NDIA has worked on recommendations made by the Senate Committee on Autism and in its, its report released in December 2022, it made two recommendations relevant to the NDIA. One of the recommendations was uh, addressed at the effectiveness of the NDIA's response to previous recommendations in relation to support of autistic people in the justice system. And uh, that issue of last resort for people 
making their way through the justice system and then leaving the justice system. So you might be aware of the Royal Commission's work following public hearing 11 and public hearing 15. Is that a, a recommendation that the NDIA proposes to act on? Do you know? I, I don't know, and that's not a, a part of the business that I'm involved in. And recommenda recommendation 80 was a recommendation that the NDIA publish the findings of its review into the complex support needs pathways and maintaining critical supports framework, including its policy on provider of last resort arrangements. Are you aware of that recommendation? No, I'm not aware of that recommendation. Uh, has there been any uh, steps taken by the NDIA to publish the findings of its review of the complex support needs pathway? I'm not aware uh, whether or not that has been published. And uh, publishing the Maintaining Critical Supports Framework? Uh, I do know that the Maintaining Critical Supports Framework is no longer a current document and that there are other, um, uh, other pieces of work that we've done instead of uh, that framework right. that's now superseded. It, would we be right in understanding that the NDIA uh, with respect to proposed changes to the complex support needs pathway and related initiatives will be published as updates to service model as service models are finalised and endorsed? I'm, I'm not aware whether or not that will happen. The complex support needs pathway does continue, is active, uh, but I'm not aware of what we intend to publish. And, you, and I assume by that you're also not able to tell us when any publication no. <laughs> may be available. Is that right? No, that's correct. Okay. So my last um, questions really relate to some issues arising from the panel this morning. Were you here uh, and had the opportunity to hear Dr Winkler's evidence? I was here for the panel this morning. So uh, a, a range of issues raised, if I summarise them, I think it might be uh, issues in terms of the funding model and uh, a perception that there may be a lack of innovation in how the NDIA thinks about the future. I've really paraphrased the evidence this morning. Is there anything you want to say in response to the evidence this morning? Uh, I think what I would say is... Um, we work very closely with Dr Winkler and others. There are many people doing um, research and considering how we move forward, particularly with some of the older models of supports in housing. Um, and we continue to work closely together on those. We've done a lot of work ourselves, as you'll see from my statement, in terms of an evidence review, responding to the independent, uh, to the uh, our own advisory council. Um, and we continue to consider um, uh, the funding models and how they can be most effective at this point for this particular cohort. So um, it, it is an area of key focus. Uh, the co-design with the work that we've done on home and living is a significant way of understanding what participants want. And, and as you said earlier, that some of them, um, uh, some people do end up staying because it's all that they know. So there are a number of actions that I think will come out of that. And the other thing um, that has just happened uh, this week is that as we've uh, reshaped under our new CEO, uh, a new um, leadership team. The, there is a change in functions to highlight home and living as a key piece of work for the agency this year. So it's it's an area that we're uh, focused on, doing a lot of um, putting a lot of effort into it, and want to move forward as the discussion came out of the, this morning, as was said. All right, one question which I omitted to ask you a little earlier, and we talked about. Um, group homes and their future. The other is the area of day programs. And in terms of the way in which we conceive of and understand what day programs might mean in the future, yeah. does the NDIA have a view on the maintenance of day programs in the form that they currently delivered it as being an appropriate or viable option into the future? And my question relates to that same, that 10-year-old, that 16-year-old, that 20-year-old, yeah. is should they, those young people have an expectation that their lives in terms of day programs will be in yeah. the same form and the same, delivered in the same manner yeah. that they presently are? Yeah. No, I don't think they should have that expectation at all. We've changed the way we fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's much more individualised. A lot of the, a, a relatively small amount of the funding 
that goes into community and social participation is in day programs. And the way we now funding day programs, the intent of that was to ensure that it was a more integrated approach. So I don't think um, that young people should anticipate that that's the only option for them in and the Ms. future. Ms Riddell gave the evidence of there being less opportunity to spend that time with their uh, clients and the people they support in terms of building independence and, and participation in the community. Mm. And I think she said if that's, if that's funded for somebody to be taken to a park for six hours and that's mm. the only nature of the activity, mm. then that doesn't seem to be a particularly good uh, alternative option no. to a congregate day program. So mm. what really needs to be done in thinking and revisioning the way in which people with disability have the opportunity to participate in the mm. community on a day-by-day -day basis, mm. assuming that they're not otherwise in employment and, and employment, that's what they, they would like to do. I can tell you that our new uh, chair and our board, which has recently been refreshed, is, is very focused on ensuring that we are funding for independence, not dependence, um, and for outcomes and to achieve their goals. And certainly the access to the community is one of the key uh, key opportunities for the scheme to make a real difference. The way we fund, the way we support and the way we encourage a market to arise, it gives people many opportunities to be independent. And in the same way that I've referred to the CRPD committee's guidelines on institutionalisation for homes, would you agree that the same features of institutionalisation should be eradicated from the way in which day programs or models of that kind should um, be developed into the future? I would agree that the vision for day programs in the future needs to be much more integrated and supporting people to achieve their goals. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask my colleagues if they have a group of questions for you. Commissioner Benton. Um, just for two questions. Um, you, it, Kate Eastman went into the work, and you described the work that you're doing in your national consultation about looking at innovation in homes. There's no sense of timing when you said, oh, we're, we're now, we've had big consultation and now we're going to develop a framework. Um, is there any sense of timing? We know that, that providers are still building large multi-resident dwellings or acquiring them. Um, so there needs to be a point of stop, and when yeah. when might that be? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. I missed the opportunity perhaps to talk about our home and living demonstration pilots, which are currently underway. So that's in my uh, witness statement as well. Um, we're about to roll out a second round of those, which is again about funding uh, organisations to put forward their innovative ideas about what's new. Uh, we have changed our funding, so we're not funding, providing any capital funding anymore for large institutions and homes. And we are um, currently actively working all the time on different ways, including our individualised living options. So that's happening now. So there are a number of things that are happening now. I'm thinking and more will come as we focus on this work. So when do we expect that more will come? to be very clear about the deinstitutionalisation arrangements we've talked about. Yeah, there are already today more opportunities for people to move into individualised living options. Those um, pathways, the funding are, is available for them already now. So there will not be a plan that says at this point um, there'll be a ceasing over the next decade or... <laughs> Uh, so we have already got a plan to cease providing capital funding for anything that is six and above. So um, you, you'll see that in, in um, my statement. So that's already happening now. Um, uh, with, um, that was a sort of a transitioning out. So anybody who is running a home with six bedrooms won't receive capital funding as that funding transitions out. So they we, still so that's, see, receive funding to support services. Uh, well, again, I think over time what will happen, because we've given individualised funding, what's actually happening is that people are not choosing to go into vacancy. So as people move out, those homes are finding it increasingly difficult to find anyone else to move in. And we are finding that there are many other options now in the market uh, for people to go into. Um, something more concrete would have been helpful. <laughs> um, and that goes for day programs. Will there be a plan 
that has very clear um, ceasing of that congregated arrangement, which we have heard are predominantly, many of those day programs are run by the same people, organisations that run the yeah. group homes. Yeah. We, ha we haven't yet done the work with um, participants to work through what those alternatives would look like. So that is something I think that will happen in the next year. We're looking at the pricing already to sort of start to de-incentivise large day programs. Um, and then I think the next focus for that will be a co-design process to work through what are those alternatives. Um, so that piece is a little earlier. The housing piece, I think, is more progressed. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner McKeown. Uh, thank you. My only question is, could you clarify what you meant when you responded to Ms Eatman's question about day program funding? And you said funding is more individualised. That's what right. What did you mean by that? So um, effectively, it is easier for somebody to take their funding um, and use it in different settings. Um, so we've kind of um, worked through with the sector on what that looks like. So people's funding enables them to move from one place to another rather than block funding day programs. OK, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Major, thank you very much for coming back to the Commission and giving evidence. We appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Ms Eastman, I think there are some directions that have been well, that, agreed. Chair, that concludes the evidence for this hearing and we've provided you with some directions which we've circulated to the parties. So my understanding, and there's some, there's some late options, uh, these directions are agreed. Thank you very much. On that basis, uh, these are the directions that uh, I will make. If any party uh, has any disagreement, they should say so at the end of the reading out, otherwise they will be the directions that are made. One, as directed uh, by me on Wednesday of this week, Sunnyfield and Afford should provide the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission with their written, response, written submissions in response to the propositions I put to their council. They should do this by 22 February 2023. To any witness who took a question on notice during this hearing may provide their response in writing to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by 24 February 2023. Any such, any such responses may be tendered into evidence by counsel assisting the Royal Commission. Three, counsel assisting will tender into evidence any additional documents she considers necessary in chambers by 3 March 2023. Four, by 31 March 2023, Council Assisting will prepare written submissions on the hearing. These submissions will be provided to parties with leave to appear and may be provided to witnesses on a confidential basis. Five, any written responses to Council Assisting submissions should be sent to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by 21 April 2023. Uh, in the absence of any objections to those directions, they are the directions then that I make. Thank you. Ms Eastman, is there anything else from you? No, that concludes the hearing and I'm sure the commissioners will be happy to adjourn now. Thank you. Uh, I, would, I will make a short, some short comments. Um, this is the last long hearing this Royal Commission will conduct. There will be opportunities later to thank all of those who have contributed to the Royal Commission's work in hearings and in the many other forms of engagement over a period which now is just short of four years. Uh, as Ms Eastman has explained, this has not been a hearing which has focused on the voices of people with lived experience of disability, but the hearing commenced with pre-recorded evidence from Sam Peterson to whom we are very grateful for their willingness to return to the Royal Commission. We're also grateful uh, to everybody else uh, and all the institutions who have given evidence uh, at this uh, hearing. I do want to say, uh, want to take this opportunity to say what a privilege it has been for me and for the other commissioners in the course of 32 public hearings and more than 150 hearing days to have heard the stories and the aspirations of so many people with lived experience of disability. It is very clear from our public hearings that people with disability are not a homogeneous group. 
We've heard from people with many different forms of physical disability. We have had evidence from people with intellectual disability, people with cognitive impairment, people with psychosocial disabilities, people with autism, people with Down syndrome. We've heard from people with disability experiencing multiple forms of disadvantage, such as First Nations people, both uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, people from the LGBTQTI community. We've heard from people with disability who are famous and from those who have previously never told their stories in public. Some of our witnesses have been very polished performers, used to speaking to or communicating with an audience. <coughs> Most have never given evidence or recorded their experiences in public. For many of those witnesses, it required very great determination and fortitude to give their evidence, even in cases where their identities were not revealed. One of the prime responsibilities of the Royal Commission has been to avoid re-traumatising witnesses who have experienced deep trauma in their lives. That responsibility is extended to the support necessary to ensure that people with disability could give evidence safely and as comfortably as possible. We owe a great debt to our councillors who have done a magnificent job supporting witnesses throughout the life of the Royal Commission. In addition to our public hearings, we've received almost 8,000 submissions. 52.5% of those have been from people with disability themselves, that is, with lived experience. Many more were from families and supporters of people with disability. And, of course, we received large numbers of submissions from disability representative organisations. Up to date, the Royal Commission has conducted, through the commissioners, 1,587 private sessions. Of these, 1,012, or 64%, have involved participants who are people with lived experience of disability. A very significant number have never previously recounted their experiences to anyone except possibly their own families or very close friends. Every single person who has engaged with the Royal Commission or has recounted individual experiences uh, is, has done so in a way that is very important to them and very important to the Royal Commission. I do want to refer very briefly to a number of witnesses, not to suggest that some experiences are more important than others, but merely to illustrate the diversity of experiences that have been the subject of evidence over the course of the Royal Commission's life. Quaden Bales is a young First Nations man with disability who gave evidence with his mother at Public Hearing 7. Quaden's evidence included his experiences of bullying and insufficient supports at school. When asked about the message he would like to give to children who do not understand how their comments can hurt him, Quaden answered, just don't be rude to kids who have disabilities, just be kind and be nice. <coughs> Colin Hisco is the president of Reinforce, a self-advocacy organisation for people with intellectual disability. He gave evidence at public hearing three and spoke about the difficulties that advocates have accessing people with disability in closed settings and made observations that many people with disability, particularly those who have been institutionalised, have no knowledge of their human rights and are denied the opportunity to exercise their rights. Mr Hisco said, why is it so hard? Why is it so damn difficult to be able to get uh, those uh, closed residential units or the group home, to get into those units or into those homes? Why is it so difficult for people with disability to have the same basic human right as anybody in this room or in the community? Why is it that we can't have the same basic things? You're allowed to get married. I might not be because I've got a disability. Mr Uli Cartwright gave evidence to the Royal Commission first in a panel of public hearing five on the experiences of people with disability during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And he gave evidence again at public hearing 30 on guardianship substituted and supported decision making. Mr Cartwright shared his experiences of being subjected to a financial administration order. He said, I wouldn't have gone through any of this if I didn't have a disability. 
If I didn't have a disability, I could have blown all my Centrelink payments the same day I got paid. I could have spent it on whatever I wanted. The difference between me and someone who has the freedom, who has the freedom to make really bad financial decisions, is that I have an intellectual disability. And somehow, that automatically means that I'm not capable of any financial decisions at all. Sophie gave evidence at Public Hearing 20, which examined the two case studies involving life without barriers, and we heard about that during this week. And we've heard about changes to the organisation and its practices since that hearing. Sophie gave very personal evidence about her experiences while living in group homes operated by Life Without Barriers, including experiences of violence, abuse, and restrictions on her right to have personal, intimate relationships in her own home. Fiona Strong is a woman of short stature who gave evidence at public hearing 28 about violence and abuse of people with disability in public places. When asked about how Australia could become a more inclusive society, she said, in terms of what needs to change, society won't change if we are not visible in a whole variety of roles, you know, and that our visibility is an equal and as a colleague. And when I look at the skills of people with disability, the number of people with disability receiving DSP, the Disability Support Pension, who have, you know, deg degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, and still not kind of working. It's as though we're not working hard enough. We are so working hard enough. And finally, I mentioned Kylie, Ms. Kylie Scott, a disability consumer representative for the Sydney Local Health District, a former Australian Special Olympian, and a person with Down syndrome. Ms. Scott gave evidence at public hearing four, which examined health care and services for people with disability, Ms. Scott gave evidence about her experiences with doctors in, in where uh, Ms. Scott had difficulty in uh, being heard and having her needs properly considered. This uh, was one element that led to the evidence of that hearing about diagnostic overshadowings. Again, I stress that the experiences related to us by every person with disability are uh, of equal importance. I've just given those illustrations to show the range of uh, people, the range of disabilities that have come to our attention and the range of issues, therefore, with which we have to deal. As I've often remarked, uh, preparing for and conducting each public hearing has required an enormous effort from many people. The Frontline Council assisting the Royal Commission, led by uh, Ms Kate Eastman, SC, have done a superb job over the life of the Royal Commission, marshalling and presenting evidence and drafting thousands of pages of council assisting submissions for the very many hearings. Council have invariably conducted the hearings in a trauma-informed manner so as to ensure that witnesses have felt safe and supported and do not run the risk of re-traumatisation by virtue of appearing at the Royal Commission. Council have always been very ably assisted by the various teams from the Office of Solicitor Assisting, who have done an enormous amount of essential background work in compiling and analysing information from a variety of sources, and then assisting with the onerous task of writing submissions and other reports. This hearing is a prime example. We have heard from 38 witnesses, either individually or in panels. A total of 22 parties were granted leave to appear. The Office of Solicitor Assisting issued 28 notices to produce to 24 service providers and received many hundreds of pages of written responses and annexed documents. Witnesses came from many parts of Australia to give evidence in the hearing room. Apart from the noise from construction activity on one day, all proceeded remarkably smoothly. Thanks are due to Ms Eastman, Ms Dowsett, Ms. Doust and Ms. Beatty for their tireless work and for maintaining the higher standards of professionalism. We thank the Office of Solicitor Assisting, the team led by Lorna Davidson and Annick Wayne, for their dedicated and meticulous preparatory work, support to Council Assisting and support to the Commissioners sitting on the hearing. We thank the Policy Branch, which has provided invaluable assistance for all of our public hearings as well, of course, as conducting and supervising a very wide range of research and writing of reports. These hearings would not be possible without all the logistical work done 
by the corporate branch of the uh, Royal Commission. They have a complex task and it is a great credit to them that the hearing has proceeded as smoothly as it has and uh, so many other hearings held by the Royal Commission have uh, proceeded. We owe a great debt to our magnificent interpreters uh, who uh, cope uh, with uh, the rapidity of speech remarkably well. We're very grateful to them for the work they've done over the life of this Royal Commission, and I'm sure Commissioner McEwen endorses uh, that comment. Our thanks to Law and Order for the technical support uh, that uh, they have provided, and our thanks uh, to uh, everybody else uh, who has uh, contributed to these hearings that uh, I at least hope will provide a permanent record of the work of the Royal Commission and be a valuable source for many, many years to come on issues associated with uh, people with disability and the need to ensure that their human rights are protected and that they are free from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Thank you to everybody. We will now adjourn. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.